Welcome. My name is Peter Kenny. I am the Ruth Bigelow Riston Curator of American Decorative Arts in the American Wing, and I am the curator of the presentation of the Duncan Fife exhibition here at the Metropolitan. Today, Sunday at the Met, is a very thrilling opportunity for me. Um, I've been working on furniture makers that haven't been with us for a long time. And lucky for us, we have some of the best in this country and Canada with us today. <laughs> You're getting in for a treat because I think we've um, had a lot of time together, this group that uh, is presenting today, talking about the concept of furniture making then and now its continuities and its, also its differences and its variations over time, which is perfect for an historian because continuity and change is really the best way to tell the story of American history. Today we're going to have a panel session. The first one is on design, which is our group today. Uh, John Donegan and Gord Peter in with me. And then we're going to have a session on the business of being a furniture maker then and now, which I hope you will find terribly interesting as well. We're going to have a wonderful presentation by two contemporary furniture makers uh, in between. And finally, we're going to have a session on technology and craftsmanship then and now, which shows everything from cutting edge laser potential in terms of working wood to back to the early period of time uh, with chisels and gouges. Uh, again, these things don't change, they're still used. Let me tell you a little bit, if I can, about why I really hoped you'd all come today, and I also hope that you'll take a little time afterwards to go over to the American Wing if we have time to see the Duncan Fife exhibition. Duncan Fife, master cabinet maker in New York, which is open now until May 6th. In June, it will travel to the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, so if you are down that way, make sure to see it there as well. Duncan Fife is an iconic figure in American craftsmanship, and many of you in the audience probably know who he was. Uh, I hope when you get to see the exhibition and we're through our discussions today, you'll have a different idea about him than kind of what has been handed down to us through time. He's an amazing craftsman, a great American story. This is his very own workshop on Fulton Street in New York. It stood there probably until the early 20th century when it was taken down at the time the um, Hudson Terminals were built. The, his backyards were literally on the site of the World Trade Center, so it gives you a sense of how central his life was to the city. Here we see his workshop, in the, I'm sorry, his showroom in the center where he has his customers. Uh, he's showing them a couple of chairs that he's made or could make for them. They may be available. He may be placing orders. He was a businessman, um, so that's very important to our knowledge of him. Uh, he was a success, too, which is rare for cabinet makers in the 18th and 19th centuries. They more often than not failed. And one of the reasons he was so successful is that he was able to build a business around real estate purchases and also had some of the finest clients in New York, uh, wealthy clients who allowed him to make his furniture. He had the name we see up there, a cabinet warehouse, is actually a very self-conscious way of saying, come see the things that I can make, my wares at my house. It's not like a warehouse that you order something from the internet and then it's put on a truck and delivered. Going to a warehouse was a stylish thing to do. One of the rare things that is in the exhibition and has brought, come down to us through time, in addition to this watercolor of Fife's shop, is this toolbox, which is Fife's own. And it's a wonderful reminder of the human side of the story. Uh, you can go see that tool chest, and in it there's a saw with his initials on it. You can see the dirt from his hand. The family lovingly preserved this, and to this day it is at the, the New York Historical Society, and luckily it's on loan for us for the exhibition as well. So the idea of business and tools, how much did this man actually make in the shop? That's the question I'm always asked. He must have had hundreds of people he employed throughout a 55-year career, so it's worth thinking about, and I think we'll get some answers perhaps today from some of the contemporary makers that we have uh, with us about the, how you populate a shop. Duncan Fife is known to us principally from an exhibition that was done here in 1922 at the Metropolitan. That was the last time a major show was done. He's the furniture maker, uh, I like to say, the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties was the time of great American heroes, Lucky Lindy, Babe Ruth, and we were inventing our own mythology around some of our early craftsmen in this great burst of nationalism that was occurring at this time, and the Met actually participated in that by having an exhibition on this man's work. 
The exhibition was done by this curator. He would have been here with you today in 1922 instead of me. Uh, and this is the book that was done on the subject. And inside, you see, it was basically a field guide to what Duncan Fife furniture looked like, whether it was made by him or not, because Fife was synonymous with a style and a moment in time, very closely aligned in the minds of many of the collectors of the period with the English Regency and its elegance, small-scale furniture, a lot of casters on it, uh, comfortable, and also in the mainstream of what was going on in terms of decorating trends. You would find New York interiors and homes and lobbies done with this furniture. Uh, I was told even there was a scene in one of, the great, in one of, of Scott Fitzgerald's books, Tender is the Night, describing a Fife dining room set, which was sort of fun by somebody. And this is the quintessential piece of Duncan Fife furniture that is coming to us out of the English Regency. You see the same legs that were on the drawings on this particular satin wood table. But he was a man who worked in many styles throughout his life, all viewing closely to the classical tradition, the neoclassical style as we call it today. And the furniture that he made, many of the sources for that furniture were printed designs that were sent to this country from, from Europe, England in particular. But the European designers were looking at classical antiquity and they were imbuing their furniture with many of the characteristics of that style. So a form like this would be based on an ancient bronze brazier with these saber-like legs. And here it is translated into furniture from a concept that's developed based at looking at classical antiquity. And this is the kind of chair that he's making uh, in New York around 1815 or so. And again, that smooth line of that lovely scrolling back and those saber-shaped front legs with the little lion's paws going in the opposite directions to the one at the back coming to us, uh, courtesy of the ancient Greek klismos form, which is revived in this period of time and extremely popular. And in the back is uh, Apollo's lyre, the uh, instrument of cosmic harmony, which makes us very pleased and in such pleasant proportions in this furniture, very delicate in scale. But this 22 show was also done for another reason. It was to celebrate this craftsman, but it was also the museum's mission at that time to help to improve industrial design in this country. So as a result, we were hoping to get buyers for department stores to come here, industrial designers and others, to look at this by furniture, and they did. One company is called the Company of Master Craftsmen, founded in Flushing, Long Island in 1925. And here you can actually see a blueprint drawing of a Fife chair in the museum's collection that was offered for sale as a reproduction that bore that stamp on the bottom after it was sold. Line for line reproductions are fine. They're not particularly the most exciting things. They're at a remove from what we see in the original. But at the same time, I think in a time of industrialization with great changes, in the later 19th century, early 20th century, it was nice to sort of come back to a more unified style, and this was part of the idea behind it. But what about Fife himself, the idea of the conception for something and making it, ultimately designing it and making it into a piece of furniture? These two uh, drawings were sent by Fife to a customer in Philadelphia, giving him a choice between two styles of chairs that come to us from classical antiquity. Now, ultimately, that customer chose the one on your right, the Klismos chair, and we can see the pricing structure for it, etc. They're not the perfect design drawings, but they're the germ of an idea that probably had been well developed by Fife by 1815 or so. And we'll explore today a little bit in our session, not today, I hope, with um, John and Gord, a little bit about how you go from a, an idea to a finished product. This doesn't change. This is a continuity in furniture. And it's very exciting to see the process. We don't know how Duncan Fife did this, exactly. Uh, we don't have diaries from him. He's not here, I was not there. But we do have living craftsmen and artists with us today to talk about this. I'd like to introduce to you, if I could today, John Dunnigan on my immediate right, who is the furniture maker who made this beautiful uh, uh, writing table and chair for a special exhibition in 2007. John is a designer, maker, and educator. His research is driven by an interest in design as an expression of the dynamic and interdependent relationships among culture, technology, and identity. His studio work has been shown in over 100 exhibitions, including 10 solo exhibitions, and it's also included in the public collections of such museums as the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston 
in the Smithsonian Museum of American Art. Dunnigan is currently, John Dunnigan is currently Professor of Furniture Design at RISD at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island, and he's currently serving as a co-planner for something called NSS EPSCOR at RISD. It's an initiative dedicated to bringing together art and design thinking with scientific thinking and to build research capacity through collaboration. John has come to us and taught for many years with a great knowledge of historical precedent in furniture design, but what's wonderful is I think he's, he's reaching forward in time and moving towards, I think, a great change in terms of uh, the way the world works, the way the furniture's made, and moving towards sustainability as well. Our other panelist is Gord Peterin. Now, Gord and John are men of different minds, as you can see. This looks more like my office, Gord. <laughs> But Gord is a, a, a fascinating man who is um, also a professor. He teaches at the Ontario College of Art and Design at the University of Toronto, where he also lives and maintains an active studio practice. He's done the usual things expected from artists, as he said to me, such as residences, lectures, exhibitions, and conference participation. Recently, he did a solo exhibition of his work organized by the Milwaukee Museum of Art and curated by Dr. Glenn Adamson of the Victoria and Albert Museum that toured nine museums across the United States. A book was published in conjunction with this called Furniture Meets Its Maker. I had a little bit of foreboding when I read that, Gord, but I think you'll see what we mean. Gord describes himself as an artist that operates on, in, and often near the territory of furniture. So we're in for an interesting exploration, I think, today uh, with both John and Gord, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to John, and he will introduce some of his work for you, so you can know who he is as a maker as well. Thank you, Peter. Can all hear me all right? Good. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you again, Peter and uh, Gord. Um, I wouldn't have invited you. I know you wouldn't. <laughs> yes. I know that's yes, that's true. Um, I, a couple of things I would say just to start, uh, and we're going to be very brief here because these are, as Peter may have said, these are we're going to do the brief things and then um, have basically three sections to this uh, little presentation. But um, in my, uh, I do uh, design things, I make things, and I teach, uh, among other things. And in my experience with um, teaching design, I would say that one of the things and I teach at a school of design, but we actually don't have courses in design. Design is something that's part of everything we do. So you don't separate it out um, as, a, you know, as a distinct thing, like, okay, now we're gonna study proportion, for example. But you do discuss that sort of thing quite a bit. So one of the things that that leads me to say about where I think we're going today that I hope can be useful in this conversation is that design does not equal style. Um, and I think style is part of design, um, and we're going to talk more in the second part of this about what we might mean by design. Um, but I should, uh, in the few minutes we have here, just... Oh, that's good. One more click. <laughs> um, I'm just going to give you uh, two quick examples here of uh, how this uh, way of working that Peter mentioned, this, this approach that I have towards seeing design as an expression of a bunch of complex relationships. Uh, one example here of how that played out in a, in, in a piece that I designed and built. This piece on the upper right is mine from about 1989. It's the fifth piece in a series that was begun um, during an exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston called New American Furniture that Ned Cook um, curated and conceived, and Bruce Beacon, who's later on the program, was involved in that as well. And this is an early 19th century sewing table uh, on the left, in the lower left corner. And very briefly, I'll say that what interested me here about this was that, of course, this kind of form um, of the sewing table disappeared as the cultural and technological changes occurred that made the behavioral patterns of sitting around in the evening and sewing, for example, a change. So um, I made a, essentially kind of a vestigial sewing table, and some of the formal aspects uh, in this case have to do with neoclassicism, 
So I use this example because of um, the fife. And one of the favorite uh, things that I like about this piece is that the, the frieze along the apron, which is a triglyph and metope, uh, the, the metopes are upholstery uh, buttons. So it was kind of a fun piece. So that's how some of that stuff comes out in my own work. Um, but I also um, like to think about and, as I say, write about and uh, talk about and teach um, this, about this idea, not just in relation to my own work. So I'd like to point out just a couple of things about um, how historical precedent and design come into contact with one another. We can start in the middle um, with the um, fifth century grave stele of Igeso, um, which actually was here in, on display some years ago. It was great to see it here in person in the museum. Um, I actually called the museum and asked if I could get close to it, and I was told the resounding no, um, but I admired it from a few feet away. Anyway, um, I would say that this represents, this is the original um, deal here. And I would say that it's the first example that we see of uh, seating of a chair, um, a representation in, in antiquity of a chair that responds to the human form, to the body, ergonomics, if you will, to use a popular term. Uh, whereas uh, on the upper left, well, let me drop down to right below it. Uh, there's a chair on the very bottom center that was designed by a Danish neoclassical painter named Abelgard around 1800 to use as a prop in his studio. And I think you can see, imagine that it's a fairly impractical chair, but I would say that this is a representation of the reproduction or copying way of dealing with historicism. And it points out in some strong way for me what I think is an interesting theory that of course the original klismos, which is what you call the Greek chair, I'm sorry if I didn't say that, um, was heavily idealized, like many things in Greek art. So um, then moving up to um, the upper left-hand corner, we have a more recent chair um, that you can still buy at Dongia. It was designed in 1989, by, I believe by John Hutton, um, who designed a lot of work for them. And it depends on this representation of the klismos, but this is what I might call transformation, because it takes this idea and reinterprets it in new materials. But it depends on the original reference. Um, next, I might say that you could um, have um, what I might call inspiration, or interpretation, I should say. If you look at the upper right-hand corner, there's a chair from about 1810 by Benjamin Latrobe, um, which, um, is interpreted in the sense that it's clearly dependent on the Greek um, ideal of a chair, but it's made a little more practical. The shape of the legs is different. You wouldn't trip over them. They wouldn't break. I mean, it's interpreted. Um, and then um, on the lower left-hand corner, this the curvy one down there on the lower left is a chair by Samuel Gregg. And I would call this a, an example of inspiration. By that, I mean that it doesn't it doesn't try to copy or reproduce the klismos at all, but it gets some uh, kind of essential idea or quality about the piece. In this case, elasticity and lightness, which it then reinterprets in a new way from 1808. Um, and then, um, have I covered them all? Well, the fife chair uh, in the lower right-hand corner, which is one of the ones from 1810, the klismos chair, I chose this because, of course, it uses, actually uses the name Klismos Chair, which he did at the time. But for me, this is an example of what I might call appropriation. It's, it's using signs and symbols of the original work to make a kind of statement, uh, cultural positioning. And in fact, it's, um, as we're going to talk about a lot today, it's a great example of the way things were marketed um, in those days, which is from the pattern books. Yeah, you could get one of these and one of those, and you had options to put them on the chair. So we'll move on to the next. Okay, great. Uh, Gore, would you like to introduce people to your work? Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, why does furniture look like us? Um, 
it's about the same size as us. Um, its parts are named after our body parts. I mean, are we actually that unimaginative? Or, you know, does it reveal something else? And I believe our penchant for uh, decorating our homes with these body-like structures, borders on some kind of insanity, frankly, <laughs> in a good way. Uh, I mean, it reveals the conceptual nature of our lives, and it seems to slip into our homes under the art guard, you know. Um, I'm not so much interested in new as I am the very, very old disorders and desires that first started us banging these objects together and placing them just to the outside of the surface of our bodies and just to the inside linings of our, I suspect, caves. Um, so that's really what, what interests me is what what caused furniture to happen? I've, I've had enough doctors, uh, psychiatrists, as clients <laughs> that I now refer to a person's decor in their home or their furniture as symptoms. <laughs> so I look at furniture a little bit differently. <clears throat> and I'll begin with this first piece which addresses the notion of comfort. Are we ever comfortable enough? I mean, the furniture field right now is constantly offering a more comfortable, ergonomically pleasing chair, you know. But each six months or each year, a new version is offered. And it doesn't seem to me like we're ever going to get 100% comfortable. This offers that secluded, comfortable, ideal space. Of course, if you step into this seating area and close the door, suddenly you'll realize you're under glass like a museum specimen, uh, and the rest of us are staring at you from without. So I suspect there's only one place that will be completely comfortable, and that perhaps is in the grave. Do I have to? Uh, okay. um, <clears throat> this piece is titled A Table Made of Wood, <clears throat> for obvious reasons. But there are certain forms that seem to get lodged in our collective consciousness. And uh, the classical uh, demi-lune table uh, is one of them and a form that I repeatedly return to. And these pieces uh, are one of the few objects that I make multiples of, and they end up in a, quite a broad variety of homes and, 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 and spaces, uh, both from a conservative uh, environment to radical uh, contemporary art collectors' uh, collections. So they really seem to morph from one thing uh, to another. Um, and this is another version. Uh, I'm suspicious, uh, frankly, of history uh, and uh, historical uh, decorative arts curators as well. Um, and sometimes I imagine uh, history unfolding slightly differently. Like what if uh, Sheridan and Heppelwhite styles were up and running just fine, but craft had lagged behind or taken somewhat of a different route. Just what if? Um, and this is maybe perhaps something that might uh, result. A view of the fine craftsmanship. Um, but uh, I was on holidays and the only materials available to me were driftwood on the beach and string uh, so I uh, tried my best to make a, uh, 
uh, demi lune table. And I threw the leftover string in, and the client uh, was most grateful. Uh, the surface, which is really all we see of objects, the surface is very revealing uh, of something. Um, and I've noticed that with uh, people who are not in the know about woodworking, uh, sense something is different when an object is veneered in wood or whether an object is solid wood. So I thought about the surface of something and made only the surface of one of these demi lune tables. It's just like the exoskeleton of, of the table made of uh, boat fiberglass. Uh, so it's very, very thin, suspended in sort of a museum uh, presentation brass uh, mount. Uh, this is titled uh, Reassembled Form. Um, I think seeing is reassembling, and whenever we view an object, uh, we bring to it everything that we've seen previously. So it's like a scanning, a re-surveying uh, of everything we've seen to try and understand what is put in front of us. So this is like a table made of, uh, a furn piece of furniture made of furniture. I believe a chair is probably the most conceptually provocative object anyone could ever produce. But it always just looks like a chair to us and it's almost impossible to see what I see in a chair. And I thought, how could I illustrate my point of view? Uh, what could I do to a chair that would turn it into a sculpture for everyone? Or better still, what could I extract from a chair, do even less work? Uh, and I decided to remove the four points that it makes contact with the floor. If a chair cannot make contact with the floor, if it can't stand up, it could not possibly be a chair. And what would I use to do that? I decided to use itself. If you had a handsaw, <clears throat> I guess you could return this to two chairs which is the title of the piece, Two Chairs. Uh, what's so interesting about a chest of drawers, the dark cavities, uh, boxes uh, intrigue us. Um, this is sort of backing up a little bit and investigating the, the volume and the translucency of a chest of drawers um, prior to all the drawers going into it and the panels going onto it. So again, trying to access the sculptural nature of a chest of drawers. Um, restoration is an interest of mine. Um, and I pick things up out of the garbage all the time. Uh, my daughters help me uh, load up the car. And my wife uh, curses me when I arrive home with more stuff. But um, and of course, the historical decorative arts uh, curators and the restorationists at museums all have a little different opinion on what is the proper etiquette when it comes to restoration. How much work, uh, what kind of work, and to what degree is appropriate. And they all uh, hate each other's guts because they think their opinion is correct and the other museums is incorrect. And I watch these discussions and I thought, what could I do to this chair which was frankly beyond restoration, in my opinion. Uh, the legs were far more damaged than what you see here, and all of the joints were far looser than glue could possibly uh, save. So I developed this object uh, that carefully uh, reinforces every one of the breaks, every one of the wobbly legs, and to some degree the upholstery, and so restores this uh, chair. And the advantage is that I can 
take this brace off of this piece and it has not in, at any point entered the flesh of, of the patient. So there'll be no trace of my particular restoration job uh, for this, this work. And I think that's my, maybe my last uh, image. Gord, yes, thank you very thank much. You, thank you for tolerating me today, that's great. <laughs> but I have to, I have to, I have to um, bring you back a little bit to something that I must do today, which is to present to you and John, for your opinions, some furniture by Duncan Fife. I find it's very interesting what you were saying, Gordon, a moment ago about, about symptom. We know who owned this chair, so we'll discuss his psychological profile a little bit when we start. And John, I think this is an appropriation, yet again, by Duncan Fife. Uh, my position on this is that William Byard who was the original owner of this chair, who lived on State Street overlooking New York Harbor, the wealthiest merchant in New York perhaps at the time, came to Duncan Fife to make him a chair that suited his taste. And his taste was very urbane. In fact, in 1807, a chair of this design would have been made in London just as well as in New York. And this is the product of that particular um, coming together of a craftsman and a patron. Uh, it's, it's, it's elegant. They tend to break. It's been fixed many times, and of course, we've elegantly disguised that. But um, yeah, let me know what you think about Fife and his work, John. Um, well, I'd be happy to. I think, um, as I, I was telling you earlier, Peter, that this is probably, in my opinion, uh, although it's the earliest example I think you have uh, in this exhibition, I think it's the best of the Duncan Fife work. Um, yes, appropriation is part of this, but um, to me, this chair is so elegant in its proportion. It's so uh, graceful. It works. We'll, we'll talk more about design in, the, in a few minutes about uh, that, but it, it has so much um, that, to me, speaks more of inspiration than appropriation. Mm -hmm. When I think of um, appropriation, I think more of... Um, of the use of a detail that might be applied to this. And I know he did many different versions of these kinds of chairs. And uh, whereas the Klismos chair had, um, you know, the sort of Kuru uh, back on it, which in fact is more, in my opinion, more Roman than Greek, um, it's entirely different. So I think this is an exquisite. So, so uh, the piece. idea in this particular case is that this is a winning design. It's more design than style, or it's more yeah. inspiration. We we need you know uh, we need six months to, to get to the bottom of what the difference is between design and style. But briefly, um, uh, we, I mean, we can't disassociate the two. But I think that uh, to me this this for this purposes of this discussion, this approaches more design than style. Okay, John. Uh, Gord, I'm sorry. Um, William Byard, wealthy New Yorker, redone his house just in 1806 on State Street, using some of the finest craftsmen in New York to do that work. Goes to Duncan Fife for this chair, and probably redoes all the furnishing in this house at that point in time to look more English Regency. I'm thinking, uh, Regency gentleman. I mean, what's your take on a chair like this and a person like that? If he were your client, let's just say. Would you not make a set for him or just one? I don't like it. It's not very good, and it breaks. <laughs> true, true. They break because the uh, seat rails are not very well conceived. If under, that, under that upholstery is a laminated series of ash, pieces of ash that curve and come to the front legs. and They are. I mean, it's a, it's a high concept, but it fails in many ways structurally. It's not very interesting. Yes, it is. Um, I can see that I know that they do break, and I, I, I know you've seen them you know, firsthand, but if you think about the dimension of that seat, it actually provides you with the opportunity to put all the mass you need in that joint. Yeah, so why it's, is it broken? Well, because they didn't put the mass in the joint. It just looks like you can. Would right? that be because of um, the inability to... Not, not know how to do it? They didn't understand the wood no, technology? No, I think they were far better craftsmen by and large than people living now for the most part. But 
Um, I, you know, I think that they uh, probably didn't uh, utilize the entire width of it or something. I mean, I haven't been inside one of those myself, but right. if you had a, you know, two and a half or three inch wide rail with a big tenon into it, into the leg, that, that should be pretty strong. Yeah, you know? I agree. I mean, there's enough, there's enough there to, to make it structurally sound. I've built but, chairs like this and they survive, but, yeah. you know, and it's also very curious uh, how the most fragile of objects also seem to survive without getting broken. You know, it's not a matter of how strong the object is. It, it's what, did it, what does it induce in the various owners to protect an object? And that's really kind of about sustainability. What allows an object to sustain, you know, and not get broken? And it's not just structural, I don't think. It's Here's another piece by, from the Fife Workshop. Um, it's brilliant in terms of color, design, I think, in this case, has taken over. Symbolically, these figures in the front are coming to us out of classical antiquity. They are based on the siren. It could be a play on words of a harpy, you know, with a harp on the back. And if you want to take it another step, John Dunnigan and Peter Kenny, that is the uh, Hibernian Society's flag symbol of the harp and carry at it. It's yeah, hi, 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 hi honey. <laughs> yeah, um, I just bought us a table. Yeah, no, I had a garage sale. It's really nice. You're going to love it. Um, yeah, it's, the top is rather plain. I, oh, a couple of thousand, not a lot. Uh -huh. No, it, it rests, uh, rests on your head, actually, it looks like. You, you'll, it, no, you don't have to hold it on your head. It's just, uh, it's resting on what appears to be a woman's uh, head. And, and actually, you've got wings, dear. Um, it's all gold. Yeah, oh, no, far more than your wedding ring, honey. No, a lot more gold on this table. And uh, the, you, you turn into a harp and a bit of a snake, and uh, your feet are lion's uh, feet. Uh, yeah, there's leaves and drapery and uh, the whole thing. You're going to absolutely uh, love it. You know, I think, I think this object is absolutely insane. <laughs> but what disappoints me is that this was made, this is radical conceptual sculpture, in my opinion, done in, I don't know when, 1820 or 30 or something. What disappoints me is that we haven't, we haven't catapulted forward. What should furniture look like now if it looked like this then? You know, that's, I don't know what happened, but we got, I mean, we look in a modern design mag today and it's, it's white and it's got stainless steel uh, or chrome legs and that's what we can handle. Let me pull you just back for a second to functionality. <laughs> Tell, your, tell Honey you're going to be playing cards with the boys tonight because that top spins, it pivots 90 degrees, it opens up, and it has a wool cloth base surface for playing cards. Once you have mastered the idea of a pivoting top, you can put anything in between. And as Gord says, where's our, our view with this today? In this period, you have griffins, lions, winged caryatids, giant lyres that fit in between. We still play cards, but most card tables are pulled out for extra company at dinner. John, what, what do you, what's, how well, does that you know, table strike I mean, you? One of, the, one of the things about this, and, and I, I was thinking this, but Gord has really, you know, framed this or put it into great context. I mean, in my experience um, in dealing with design students, both undergraduate and graduate, um, there are occasions, and this happens to me with some frequency, where I would, I would dare somebody to do something like this. Okay. You know, and I, and I would challenge them that, um, that they're being entirely too conservative. And that you ought to think, as, as Gord said, about just how over the top this work was. But another thing I would say about it, I know we've got to move on, but to me there's a, there's a big difference between the work of the 1808s and 10s to, to this work. Yeah. In the tra trajectory of Fife's work. A real I mean, this, sea change. Yeah, yeah. real in the, change. In the exhibition when you go to see it, uh, by the time you move into the 20s and 30s, major changes have occurred in terms of color, right. specialization in the workmanship. Um, now, we've commented on some Fife furniture, and we know how you gentlemen think. Um, as I said before, Duncan Fife isn't here, and I wasn't there, and I, I don't know how he had arrived at a concept like this and wound up having it look exactly like this. Obviously, he looked at 
designed books and had customers who have participated in the purchase. Tell me a little bit about how your approach to making a furniture look like what you want it to look like or say what you want it to say. Gord oh, or John, either one. Do I need that? Yeah, he'll need that. It's Gord first. Okay, I'm sorry. There. Oh. <laughs> Spilled the beans. Sorry. <laughs> this is how I get to my work. Um, I guess the few images I have next are sort of, um, I would like to stay within the field of furniture um, as, as my primary output, but unfortunately I have a number of sort of side trajectories, investigations going on. Uh, my output is somewhat more broad than just furniture. But uh, this really is like um, an investigation of if, if furniture is simply kind of a prosthetic for the body, which it is, both, both conceptually and physically, um, what other ways are there to experiment with the body? What uh, slapstick, uh, comedy, um, uh, sadomasochism, whatever the topic is, the body can handle a lot more uh, resistance and, and uh, manipulation. Uh, this is my, uh, one of my oldest daughter uh, modeling one of my inventions. Uh, this is adjustable. Um, you know, our desire to be good, uh, as if being bad is, is wrong. Uh, this is a, a strap-on halo, uh, which is also adjustable. And uh, as long as you're wearing this, uh, you can do no wrong. Uh, sexuality, money, uh, I had to restore my wallet one day, which I was quite fond of, and I thought that I would just uh, stitch uh, the broken seam up, and then, as my work often does, it just took on a life of its own, and having two daughters, uh, there was endless number of Barbies all around my house, which is a fascinating, iconic object, Barbie. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of a cross between she's missing a shoe she's always losing her shoes uh, drawing uh, some things don't work built uh, drawing for me is another way of investigating my ideas um, flat art has a place in my brain uh, for one thing you can you can do a drawing and erase part of a drawing which you cannot do in woodworking to kind of partially eradicate uh, an area. Mm, what gets hidden and what gets revealed is a lot easier in a drawing than in three dimensions. Uh, and I paint uh, the psychiatrist's uh, fear uh, a fear of what? Uh, so I put a little chair into the side. Uh, suspicious, um, but the globular guppiness of paint I really enjoy, and it's almost a three-dimensional method of, of expression. Uh, and my ideas of when did furniture begin? When did decorating start happening? And I'm presently reading a book that takes us from the chimp that apparently is our distant ancestor in Central Africa, all the way through the evolution of man, uh, which is, they apparently have this tracked accurately now with DNA testing. Uh, this is a, this is, a, you know, an ape walks into a room and sees what we have done and judges us. <laughs> what, what would he think? Uh, I've, I've, this is a very good client of mine, a very good friend, and he's uh, closing his uh, practice as a doctor, and he said to me one day, he said, I'm thinking of uh, doing a little woodworking uh, and making a little money. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God, this sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. And he shows up at my shop with a little money. And he's now selling these things, and I think it's just a great conceptual, flat-footed, uh, and I wish I'd thought of it. 
It drives me crazy. And uh, again, a cross between drawing. I, I like to go at historical forms, uh, an early frame by um, Breuer, Marcel Breuer, uh, just to point out again, perhaps, what he must have discovered, that a chair could occur from one single continuous line. And all I did was electrify it. It's titled Electric Chair. Um, I decided that it would be fun to restore a chair using bone, the body's bone. Um, and I, I cut off all the points of a set of antlers, uh, getting ready to figure out how to rework bone into the chair. But then, again, the points took a mind of their own, and I started drilling out the center of the pointed parts of the antler and fitting my fingers up into the center of the bone. And uh, there was exactly five. And people ask me, is it important that your, your work is functional, Gord? And it is very important that my work is functional in, in some way. And I went to a lot of work to get each of my fingers to fit up inside these bones. It's called conservator's claws. Again, I'm suspicious of conservators um, and how they handle historical objects and perhaps somewhat claw-like and heavy-handed or delicate. I think that's my last slide. Well, Thank Gord, you. Gord, um, I was hoping somebody would get to meet you and shake your hand at the end, but maybe they'll be afraid now. <laughs> well, the client who owns that uh, often likes to have a, a cocktail wearing it and a smoke his cigarette, and he wears it uh, quite often and finds it most entertaining. And I, when he first saw it, he could not not buy it. So he... Yeah. <laughs> and John, concept and realization in furniture. Tell us a little bit about yourself, that way. Sure. Um, I, uh, first, a, a thought occurs to me, I'll be very brief, but um, uh, in, in my work as a teacher, um, one thing has come up that uh, strikes me as this perfect example of cultural changes and shifts as it relates to furniture design, and Duncan Fife in particular, and that is that um, often when I show in, in these days, when I ask someone to identify a Duncan Fife piece on, say, a slide exam, um, Duncan Fife is spelled D-U-N-K-I-N apostrophe. <laughs> um, That's New England for you. <laughs> so, well, his uh, name was uh, F-I-F-E, F -E, yes. wasn't it? Well, he yes. his Before name, he yes. uppities his name. But, but um, yeah. Yeah, I know it's... Yeah. That's amazing. That's an important point. But I would, uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like to try to say, you know, again, a little context about um, this business of design, that we use the term interchangeably sometimes with style, excuse me, um, in a lot of different ways. But we can think of design as a process, right, or a practice, um, which I like to think, that's the way I like to think of design. But we can also think of design as the product or the result or the outcome of that practice. A thing, an object, a product, a drawing, a plan. I mean, all these things are what we call design. We can think of design as appearance, and this gets pretty close to what I think we mean by style, the design of something, its appearance. Um, or we can think of design as a quality. And I think Peter was saying something earlier about being able to um, really tell a Fife piece when you put it up against other, um, other pieces of, of a similar period. When I think of design as a quality, and I don't mean this in, the, in, in a negative way, but think of like designer genes. Right? What are designer genes? Design is, is a quality. Um, but really I think that design is kind of all of these things. So, you know, it's a process where you've got to judge certain things like proportion and color and texture and cost and client and all this. So anyway, here's a couple of examples, I'll go through them very quickly, of how I did this in, in some of my work. This is a piece of mine in the center here at the top um, called uh, Vestigial Bonheur du Jour. And um, although it's been called uh, Boner du Jour by uh, more than one person uh, that I know, uh, but anyway, um, 
I was, uh, had this great opportunity, and I was asked some years ago um, to make something for the Museum of Art at RISD um, that was about my recollections, my experiences with the collection. So, uh, you know, there's so many things that I liked about that collection, but, um, I, and two of, two of the types are here, a third is, is missing. Um, but I, I was always fascinated by this idea of the knee hole desk. I think it's a really odd concept, the knee hole. And, and then I was fascinated by the idea of the uh, Bona du Jour, the writing desk, although this is not the one from the RISD Museum. In fact, this one is from the Met. Um, I was looking at more of a federal one. And then I've always been nervous around all those wonderful Baroque chests on stand that we have that look like as soon as you open a the drawer, they'll fall over. It's a sort of teetering, precarious kind of quality. So I came up with this thing that um, I call a bona du jour, but, I w but you can't, there's no writing surface. That's a very functional piece. You can use it to put anything in it or on it. Um, I resisted the temptation to make it um, sort of comical in a way. I tried to do my best cabinet making on this piece. But it's, it's about the idea, once again, of the shift. And it comes about as a, from a, I believe from a conceptual point of departure about the idea of happiness, the happiness of the day, writing, changes in culture and history, technology, that sort of thing. So um, here, and so that was a very specific opportunity to deal with historic references in my life. Here are two chairs of mine that actually, believe it or not, don't have historical reference, at least directly although they sure look to me like they do. But in the one on the left I designed in 1979 um, uh, as, a, as a dining chair, and I was thinking about seating. And for me, the essence of seating is the thing you sit on, where your butt goes. It's a, you know, it's a seat. So, and everything else is, uh, emanates from that. So proportionally, the seat is larger. Um, the legs um, curve out from there the shapes, the curves, the proportions, everything, are derived from this point of view of just thinking about seating, trying to boil it down to its essence. The fact that it may share a whole lot of things with a klismos or a fife or any number of other things is sort of serendipitous um, in, in my point way of looking at it. I mean, um, if I think that I've, by some circumstance, walked down the same path, that's pretty good. Um, on the right is a um, chair that I did in about 2000. Um, you get, uh, I got doing upholstered work early on in my career, and um, people tend to associate you with certain things. So I've done a lot of upholstered work over the, over the years, and I like doing it, and so it's kind of a stock thing for me in a way. But the reason I put this slide in here is that it's got a scroll back kind of crest rail on it. And I have to admit that that must have crept into my, um, my consciousness from looking at historical work. And lastly, quickly, just to point out once again this, this idea of the way things look as a result of the interdependencies of identity and culture and technology and all this rich stuff that we're about. There's a chair on the left. It's actually a Swedish chair from 1790. And on the right, uh, it's an oval back um, chair. And on the right is the uh, Louis Ghost chairs that everyone knows by Philippe Stark from about 2002, I think they are, um, sometime fairly recently. And they're injection molded polycarbonate. One depends entirely on the other. And I think they are both in their own way um, great examples of design. Although I will confess that the circumstances surrounding the, the, the lives and the moment of creation of these pieces would be entirely different. The person on the left, no doubt, didn't use the term designer, probably didn't call themselves a designer, and probably made the thing, which is completely different than the thing on the right. But for me, they're all part of the same thing. Thank you, John. Well, in the end, we have to sell these things, don't we? Yeah. And let's talk about the business of cabin making. I think it's time for us to leave the stage and open it up for Ned Cook and 
and Bruce Beacon and Tom Moser. Thank you very much. I just uh, wanted to provide an introduction. Um, one of the things that Peter pointed out in his, in his introduction to the Fife exhibition is sort of that whole transformation of the way Fife was viewed in the early 20s, sort of that notion about the canonical um, craftsman, somebody who had uh, a real sort of sense of the uh, individual genius who was going to stand in for the whole time period. And the whole shift of Peter's exhibition to move away from just that aesthetic individual um, into a variety of other approaches to dig into the notion about how did he come up with ideas. Um, but what I'd like to do in this next panel is to look at it a little bit different, to restore a sense of the economics uh, of craftsmanship. And when I talk about sort of uh, the introduction of, um, of how the shop functioned, what about um, the way in which they tried to push their work out? I think that there's a way in which we might focus our attention instead on sort of the human element uh, of the shop. Um, it's not simply Duncan Fife. Um, he's not Diana Ross with the Supremes just backing him up um, sort of inconsequentially. Um, there is the sense of uh, the ways in which the how he went about establishing um, his reputation. How does he sort of build his brand, if we wanted to use uh, terms in today's marketplace, um, or even sort of that notion about um, the connection to the outside marketplace. In some respects, it's trying to look into this uh, entrepreneurial um, sort of uh, individual, somebody whose career did last for such a long time. And so to start to think about ways in which it's really about people, it's about planning, and oftentimes it's about serendipity, um, things that may, he may not even be able to control. And in putting uh, a panel like this together, I, I thought of two different um, makers who I thought would be um, wonderful um, to bring together in a conversation about um, such uh, an issue. Our first one to my right uh, is Bruce Beacon, um, who's come at this work um, through a not necessarily a linear path, uh, but one actually that does make sense um, when you look back at it. He originally got into woodworking training with a traditional canoe maker um, and appreciating sort of the finer points of the truly utilitarian basis of joints, lightness, materials, etc. And then went on to sort of veer from um, rural New England down into Boston to do a more academic program, uh, Certificate of Mastery at BU, Boston University's program in artisanry, and sort of set him off on a, um, a trajectory of making pretty much one-off objects for uh, exhibitions uh, and for a gallery scene. And then sort of morphing into a partnership with another um, classmate from uh, the program in artistry with Jeff Parsons, um, and started to take on a, a different kind of business model, uh, one that was still very much engaged with um, problem solving from a technical point of view, doing um, almost impossible work like uh, chairs for Klaus Aldenberg, um, some pretty amazing laminated. Oh, sorry, Roy Lichtenstein. Lost translation there. I remember seeing them in process with the, the laminations, but the Lichtenstein um, sorts of almost calligraphic uh, chairs. And then ultimately um, doing even small batch work uh, for universities, oftentimes using university or college uh, forest woods. And it got him into this whole um, way of thinking about um, a what we might think about as a commodity chain um, of materials, and techniques, um, people, and uh, a market for sustainable furniture, uh, in essence, and sustainability being more than just you know, green wood um, that is uh, responsibly harvested wood, but uh, an economic model that sort of worked in a um, through and through the system of people, marketplace, et cetera, that he'll talk about. The other panelist to my further right, Tom Moser, um, somebody who's been in the business um, for, as he said, almost as long as Duncan Fife. Um, <laughs> and, you know, sort of my not, idea... Not contemporaneous. No, 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 that's right. <laughs> <laughs> not the yeah. same birth year. <laughs> but um, 
my idea of getting Tom involved um, came some years ago when he and I were um, sitting over lunch talking about um, programming um, that he wanted to get involved with in different areas. And I sort of said, I'd really like to sort of do something on furniture history in New York. And so I started talking about Duncan Fife and sort of these kinds of connections that I saw. And um, Tom just perked right up um, and really sort of thought of himself um, as you described yourself as an incrementalist um, at that time, of somebody who just keeps on perfecting things. And he's somebody who, I think, really, through that kind of path of self-taught um, and working on that kind of refinement um, over the course of his career, is, as he remarked um, earlier this week, sort of eerily parallel um, to Fife. Um, how many years, um, sort of refinement of what's going on within design at a particular point in time, and then, I was getting struck by sort of the way you adapted names, um, that Fife puts a PH and then your advertising becomes THOS, period, um, as a reference, you know, much as uh, Fife is sort of responding to the classical kind of world, what you did initially in terms of putting your um, work that was originally sort of Shaker and uh, Colonial inspired, sort of using a common kind of shortening uh, of a name for that same sort of reason. And today, um, you know, not only is he is Tom a maker, but um, as we'll see, he's somebody who's actually been in the uh, business of teaching uh, that is spawning a number of people who have gone on in terms of productive careers in and of their own right. So I thought I'd turn it over um, to them to be able to um, address some of their work and give you uh, a way in which they've uh, come about um, over the course of their careers. So I'll turn it over to Bruce first. Ned asked me to uh, spend a few minutes talking about, uh, thank you, Ned, um, about our business. And it's interesting to me to be here talking to you uh, with Tom Mosier as a businessman because it was actually five or six years after uh, college and after operating as a business that I actually admitted that, in fact, I was a business person. Uh, I thought of myself and really continued to as first a furniture maker. And so I think what you uh, may uh, um, perceive about uh, the business I'm going to describe to you, Beacon Parsons, is that in a lot of ways it's a, uh, a business model based upon a, a method of uh, continually um, uh, uh, er earning the right to continue to make furniture in the uh, basically the self-indulgent way that Jeff and I um, so love to, to make furniture in. Um, th this will be a little narrative. Uh, we, we, we began our partnership in 1983 and uh, that's when uh, Jeff joined me in Vermont after uh, we met in Boston, um, and our early years were really a, an exploration of uh, the relationship between design and process, and this has continued to be a fascination of ours and I think uh, has uh, informed some of our business um, activities, or, or maybe you could uh, see them as strategies. Um, interestingly, too, this early chair uh, was made of elm, uh, uh, a wood that was uh, available to us uh, because of where we worked and when we were uh, when we were working. Um, uh, this particular chair is from a, a, a similar early era. Uh, we were doing some exhibition work. This was uh, um, uh, in conjunction with our uh, hometown museum, the Shelburne Museum and they were celebrating Vermont's um, uh, some centennial year of incorporation and uh, we were making pieces. Uh, uh, we, a group of about 25 of we Vermonters, were making pieces from their, uh, from their um, collection uh, based upon our way of thinking about things and making things. It was actually made, um, interestingly, um, uh, and I'll discuss why that is uh, in a minute. 
uh, from hickory, from uh, a hickory that was actually pulled off of a, of a wagon load of wood that was on its way to the um, a firewood processing um, plant. <clears throat> Jeff and I formed our partnership <clears throat> with the idea that we would um, try to bring the studio sensibilities that we um, studied in school and that we were interested in to production scale of, um, uh, of doing business, production scale of uh, manufacturing, which uh, suggested also uh, adjusting the way that we uh, design things, recognizing that multiples were going to be required. And this was really one of our early um, pieces. It was for the Vermont Law School. Um, uh, I believe we made 350 of these, and in fact, we did not make these in our shop. We went to a, a factory in Pennsylvania uh, and we sort of supervised the manufacturing of these um, chairs and got a real education in production manufacturing that inspired us to, for quite a while, to um, restrict those activities to our shop and to um, relationships that were closer to home. Uh, this is our shop. Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, the very left-hand corner is our part of the, this building. We're, we're phenomenally uh, um, fortunate to, to work in a, in a really uh, special place. This is Shelburne Farms. Uh, we're located in Shelburne, Vermont. Um, and uh, Shelburne Farms is a, a place that uh, was built in the late 1800s by uh, a family interested in... Um, uh, agricultural, uh, progressive agricultural thought and practice. And today, Shelburne Farms is a uh, place that uh, has a, a herd of dairy uh, cattle that they milk from which they make cheese. Uh, there's a small squad of educators that are devoted to um, uh, making, uh, uh, teaching the public, particularly school children, about uh, nature about uh, natural resources and uh, about the sustainable use of these, uh, these resources. And really the fact that we work here has had a huge influence on uh, our thinking and uh, in some of the questions that we've asked as we've refined the, uh, our sense of what our business is. Um, We've developed a rather keen interest in uh, forestry, and uh, uh, the furniture that we make now begins as uh, trees, um, often trees that are standing like this one. Uh, this is a walnut that uh, actually came down last summer um, from the grounds of, a, of an, another nearby museum. Um, we uh, have a hand in, in processing these trees. We uh, saw them. We have a kiln in our um, shop that uh, we use to dry this lumber. And one of the questions that we asked uh, that was really uh, sort of a watershed question was how can we as a business um, conduct ourselves uh, in a way that really supports the quality and the health of the forests upon which we depend? Um, typically, furniture makers have really wanted the, the best of the forest and. Uh, that has led to some um, practices that are um, not very positive for forest health. And what our question was is, you know, if we can under understand what the forest is made of, what actually grows there in terms of trees, and to use those in such a way as to leave the best trees in the forest uh, to enhance their quality and their longevity and health, learn how to use the rest, can we... Uh, learn how to make a silks purse out of a sow's ear. Can we learn how to technically do this and how to market this? And uh, uh, this has been a fascination of ours. Um, so we're using local woods. And um, uh, in, in doing so, we've been um, uh, introduced to, to a variety of species that uh, have been a pleasure to get to know. This is shagbark hickory. Um, there, there are about 35 different kinds of hardwoods that grow in our area. Um, we can buy about 
three or four of those species um, from our commercial sources. So woods like shagbark hickory and black locust and hop horn beam and different kinds of oaks and ashes. Have been, it's been a real pleasure to get to know these materials and to offer them to our clients, and not as just different looking woods, but as a, uh, a, a way to connect with the place that their piece of furniture came from. And a lot of what we do as a business is offering our clients a link with place and with an ethos that matters to them. <clears throat> um, oh, this is maple, and uh, you know, this chair, along with the last one, really shows, uh, is an effort to show uh, the aesthetic impact of using wood that is unsorted, ungraded lumber. Uh, so we really relish the use of knots and streaks and that kind of natural quality that, that really grows in every tree. Um, our business, and I'm going to about to wrap this up, is also uh, predicated on, uh, we chose to, to grow a business that was flexible and it could handle larger projects, uh, production scale projects, but also kept a very close, intimate hand um, on making things. I have a workbench and uh, our business is three guys and um, uh, uh, every day there's something on each one of our benches while uh, we at some time are probably doing some design work on our laptops which are also on our benches sometimes and are having pieces made in other shops uh, sometimes in large volumes or sometimes by uh, places like this. Uh, this is a water jet and so we're exporting CNC files to uh, a very small business uh, 15 miles from our shop um, and incorporating a lot of steel in our, um, in our design and in our, in our pieces. Um, it, uh, this piece of furniture sort of embodies the use of local materials, of uh, digital um, uh, technology. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, details about this table that support that claim and comment, but I think in interest of uh, time, I'll, um, I'll skip along. Uh, this is the kind of drawing that we're now doing. Uh, I don't think this is <clears throat> at all unique in, uh, in the furniture making world or in the world of making anything today. Um, but it affords us with the ability to work laterally with other businesses because uh, this sort of drawing is a phenomenal communication tool so we can make a file that another, uh, another craftsman with a CNC router uh, um, can uh, help us uh, uh, get accurate parts made uh, or that water jet. Um, um, <clears throat> So to sum up, uh, uh, our business is uh, one that designs and makes furniture to order. So our relationship with our clients is very important. We don't really have a production line. Um, we have one little one. Maybe I'll talk about that later. Um, we work with uh, individual clients who may be businesses, uh, individual clients who may be homeowners, make dining tables and so forth. And also some of our clients are um, university uh, libraries or uh, places that require volumes of, for example, chairs that are in the two, three, four hundred um, cuttings, all from a small three-person shop where we get sawdust on us uh, every day and continue to discover how much we like doing what we do. Uh, well, well, let me uh, say it's very pleasurable to be here. It's especially uh, pleasurable to realize that the Canadians have finally surpassed us. Uh, <clears throat> that presentation of uh, uh, Gord's on uh, his furniture, I'm th uh, speaking particularly of the unpainted Louis Louise Nevelson uh, table. Uh, you know, only a decadent society can produce furniture that cannot be sat in. Uh, I, uh, and you know, I have to admit, you Canadians have you've outdone us. Uh, we were doing that sort of thing 20 or 30 years ago, and now you're doing it. More power to you. Uh, unfortunately, the...
production we do typically is more functional, and you can actually sit in our chairs and eat off of our tables. Uh, and they do have some longevity, I, I'm hoping. Uh, when, we, uh, when I had the assignment to come and speak about uh, how my work uh, might relate to Duncan Fife's work, um, I took the opportunity immediately because I respect a man who in his lifetime created something that became generic. You know, there's a th you know the thermos bottle? Th th that's a capital T because that's a brand name. Uh, or formica, you know, that's melamine or laminated plastic. Yet the word formica, we assume, is generic and covers all that. Well, Duncan Fife had an influence so great that a period in American history was defined as Duncan Fife. I remember the three-legged split dining tables, which were Duncan Fife tables. And I ass I'm assuming that that's probably the highest credit an individual can get who's doing the sort of work he does, uh, or did. And uh, although I am not personally enamored of Duncan Fife's work, it is not my aesthetic. Uh, I am intellectually marvel at what he was able to achieve in his time. And in reading the books that I have been looking at these last three weeks, I find myself shocked in discovering uh, commonalities. And so uh, we begin, as you mentioned, Ned. Uh, my name is Thomas, but when I created the, the company, it was suggested that I abbreviate it to THOS, period, the old fashioned way of saying Thomas. And I, of course, Fife spelled his name F I, and then he changed it to PH. So there's a comparison. <laughs> he functioned for 45 years. On February 2nd of next month, we celebrate our 40th year. So I'm not quite finished yet, but close. 55, Tom, you got more to go. Oh, 55? Are you counting the first little, OK. Is it 55? Yeah. Oh, my God. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Yeah, sure. uh, uh, <laughs> uh, um, you know, if anything, you have to say his work is derivative. It's based upon historical forms, typically uh, those that have, were published in his time. And our work is based on historical forms. Uh, although he celebrated ornamentation and decoration, I went the other way to the extreme and celebrated austerity and the removal of ornament and decoration. But we both had the same modality, except we were working in different directions. Uh, he had four sons. I have four sons. <laughs> Three of his sons worked in his business. Three of my sons work in my business. Uh, I've read he had approximately 130 employees at one point. I have 134 employees. This is becoming kind of spooky. Uh, he spent $1,000 on a single mahogany log. Well, $1,000 in those days was tremendously more than it is today. And I spend triple premium on cherry logs from Pennsylvania. I don't, we don't go into the rainforest with our work. So in any case, he was not afraid to spend money on raw materials. And in fact, he knew a secret that a few of us are aware of. We gain uh, reputation and praise for something that we do not deserve. And that is, we are taking credit for the work that only the hand of God produced. I'm talking about the beauty of wood as it is released and properly finished. His crotch grain mahogany, his veneers, his edge bandings, all of his work reveal a beauty that is inherent in the log. And I would like to think that we are doing the same thing, releasing beauty that is inherent in the tree. In our case, cherry, walnut, maybe maple. What else? He outsourced a lot of his production, his uh, gilding, some of his carving, his hardware, brass uh, work, steel work. He outsourced a lot of his upholstery. He even outsourced furniture components. Guess who outsources the same stuff? Uh, you know, we do. We use other people's assets in developing our company. Uh, I've been, I am, we are currently experiencing our seventh recession. 
and it's been going on, for, I think, for two and a half years, uh, in spite of what economists tell us. In any case, you know, the, the we, we created it in the recession of the oil embargo when OPEC was formed, and then we had Jimmy Carter's 21% interest, and then we had two housing busts, and then we had the dot-com, and then we had 9-11. So we've been through all those recessions, and he went through the same thing, if you read his history. Uh, so, uh, you know, to be able to survive 40 or 50 years through those vicissitudes is a pretty wonderful thing. And uh, the last real uh, interesting commonality is that much of Duncan Fife's uh, image today is, uh, uh, is a result of his biographer, a man named Hagen. Guess who my helper is in the prototype shop? Jim Hagen. Uh, You're going to release him to listen, do some writing? Now, well, you know, I told this to some friends the other night, and they said, uh, how old was he when he died? Uh, uh, I think he was 71? No, more. So, oh, 74? No, more. Oh, how much? Don't tell me he was 77. 84. 84. Oh, that's right, 1950, 1852, something like that, yeah. Well, I have a ways to go then. I, thank you very much for, for giving me that. Uh, well, uh, what do we do? There'll be one point, go ahead. Okay, that, uh, that's kind of a history. We started in 1972. We bought an old Grange Hall in New Gloucester, Maine. Uh, I had been teaching up prior to that. I was a professor of communications, which had very little to do with woodworking. But I always had that passion, and uh, that woodworking program uh, uh, has grown since those early days. Uh, by 1978, that's the crew on the left standing in front of the old church vestry, which we moved over as our first showroom. This was in New Gloucester, Maine, which is the crossroads of the Western world up in, uh, <laughs> uh, up in Maine. And of course, people would flood in to buy our furniture. Uh, uh, you will notice that there are only two women in the picture. In those days, women didn't work in woodworking so much. Uh, the gal in the middle is my wife, Mary. Uh, in the white pants, and the wonderful ratio exists between direct production and uh, support. In those days, it was 12 to 1 ratio. Uh, and uh, I always call the people in support the parasites who live off the work of the actual people who make the things. What do you think our ratio is today? It's, uh, it's about 50-50. We have as many parasites, and I'm including myself as, in that, as we do makers on, on the shop floor. Uh, and uh, that's uh, how that picture got in here, I don't know, but that's our passport picture from uh, when we went to the Far East, uh, uh, Middle East. In any case, that's my son Andy uh, wearing a Bates t-shirt. I taught at Bates, and uh, he, uh, he is, he's still with us. He's, he's, he does all of our repair and, and uh, uh, warranty work. We have a lifetime warranty on everything we sell so that if it ever breaks, we correct it at our expense. Uh, that's how they look today, or more recently. Uh, that's the family, and as I said, uh, all but Matt is in the business. Uh, now, as I understand it, Duncan Fife's kids didn't stay with the business. They, one of them became a lumber, went into lumber sales and other uh, commercial activities. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in, the, in our term. Uh, as was suggested, our early furniture was very heavily Shaker-inspired. Sabbath Day Lake is the last of the living Shaker communities, which happens to be across uh, town in, in uh, Sabbath Day, Maine. And you can see the, uh, the chest is basically based upon shake and f shaker formulas. And I've also been interested in, uh, in uh, Windsor forms. And so uh, many years ago, a group of 21 uh, financial uh, investors in New York who met once a year wanted a special chair for themselves Actually, they didn't even ask for a chair. They just wanted something special that they could have for their annual meeting. And this is, chair turned out to be it, and we've been making it ever since. Um, the, uh, the furniture, really, it started off as uh, an, an allegiance to early 19th century primitive American forms. Uh, and uh, 
it has evolved slowly over the years uh, to become perhaps more sculptural. Uh, 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 Saarinen, we owe something to Saarinen on the left and uh, probably to uh, Sam Maloof on the right. Uh, what's happened in the, in the last particularly eight or 10 years is my son David, the youngest of the four boys, is increasingly taking over the design responsibility. And while my uh, interest resides in proto, you know, historical prototypical work, uh, I like to think I'm a bit of a his history buff in design, he isn't. He always looks to the future. And so his work is obviously uh, more contemporary in form. Uh, we do collaborate as we ha did, for example, in this chaise, it was a collaboration. Uh, everything is made of wood. We stay away from metal, oh, and if we do use it, it'll be bronze or perhaps stainless steel. Uh, and we do, uh, we have a number of technologies that allow us to do, to stretch wood to its limits. Uh, our most recent uh, development uh, is this series, which is, we are calling it Ellipse. Uh, it has a strong, uh, perhaps uh, mid 20th century Danish feel, uh, and uh, at last count, I think we have 320 individual pieces of furniture in our style guide, uh, so that uh, it's staggering how many we have uh, accumulated over the years. Uh, we also do uh, institutional work, libraries particularly, academic. We've done many, many uh, university libraries, uh, our, uh, the recent of which would have been Duke University, uh, uh, University of Georgia Learning Center. Uh, we are very close to get, it has, I shouldn't even mention this, but we're, we're trying to get the uh, Princeton uh, Center for Advanced Studies project. And uh, we're working slowly on the George W. Bush Library out of uh, SMU in, in, in uh, Dallas. So uh, our work is appropriate to libraries because Libraries are places where they're not interested in fashion, uh, nor are they necessarily interested in style. Can I talk about those style, design, fashion? Uh, uh, they are interested in longevity and, uh, and having many generations of students using the library without having to replace the furniture. And so as it turns out that in a way we sit with our eyes uh, and that's why the arts and crafts formula, the heavy, uh, uh, box frame chairs and, and, and solid tables uh, are very appropriate uh, to library interiors. Um, uh, in terms of business, I'm beginning to share a great deal now, not only with Duncan Fife, uh, but, uh, uh, but with uh, the presidential hopeful Romney. Uh, Romney, is, uh, he, 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 uh, he took a hit yesterday uh, because he's a, he's a profit monger. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid uh, I have also been somewhat interested in profit because uh, I believe that it is profit that causes us to improve our skills and to make better lives for us and the 135 people or so who, who work there and their families and their mortgages. Uh, and so, uh, it's been interesting over these uh, four decades. F furniture makers, 20th century furniture makers in America are alternate lifestyle people. They tend to, they can, tend to be fairly highly educated uh, and um, they uh, turn their back upon uh, maybe financial, uh, the financial sector of, you know, where they might or at another time have, and, and they go back to working with their hands. And so a lot of them are, are committed to poverty vows. They, you know, they, uh, they just don't want to be successful. And, and if you are successful, of course, you're vilified. But that's changing. That's changing. Uh, am I, is that, I think that's the end. Uh, those, these are our showrooms. You, you, you should know that uh, the newest showroom is in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Just, oh, we opened it on 11, 11, 11, 11, 11. Uh, act really, actually it was 10 o'clock in the morning, but I had to move it to 11 minutes after 11. Uh, and uh, 
we just signed a lease for a new showroom in Greenwich. So we'll be opening there in a couple of months. Uh, in the meantime, if you would like to see some of the furniture, it's over on Madison and 62nd. So what I'd like to do is um, I'd ask Bruce and Tom just to pull some images together. We've talked a little bit about the expansion um, that Tom uh, encountered in uh, New Gloucester to the current facility. Um, Bruce um, didn't have a uh, picture of the uh, kind of ephemeral first shop, um, but certainly, you know, started um, not necessarily in the uh, the grand environment of the great barn of uh, Shelburne, um, but you know, doing this kind of very uh, skill intensive, technique intensive uh, kind of work, such as he did for a RISD show on uh, laminated uh, furniture, such you see here in this tea cart. But I asked each of them just to put a few slides together about adjusting um, the initial strategy. And certainly Tom um, has talked a little bit about sort of that transformation from painted pine and looking at Shaker or um, sort of Russ Russell Cattell's early pine furniture of New England that you'd see in the hutch on the left to some of David's designs um, that are sort of more stack laminated, uh, Wendell Castle-esque um, sorts of work that you see on the right that give you a, uh, quite a, a range of work. Um, or in honor of the Newport sales um, at Americana Week this, <laughs> this past week. This is, uh, this is an important moment in our, in our early evolution. Uh, in the early days, uh, we didn't know exactly what we would be doing. We just loved working in wood, and we did almost anything made out of wood, including spiral staircases and water wheels, and, uh, and we aspired to uh, the highest form of woodworking in this country, which would have been you know, Newport, Rhode Island, uh, chest on chest, mm -hmm. all that. And we made a pair of these in Mahogany. One went to Detroit, another one went to uh, Baltimore. And we were paid well for it. But I realized afterwards that we were not gaining any equity. The equity that we were advancing was an equity of a family named Goddard and Townsend and they've been dead for 200 years. Why are we replicating that? We need to de design a, uh, an identifiable uh, form that would, be, that would enhance our efforts and would grow with time. And that's when we got away from doing reproductions uh, to doing the work we've been doing these last 35 years. But a lot of people end up starting off doing that kind of thing just to build up skill base and uh, keep work flowing, and then that kind of transition to your own equity is, and, is and the important. And that one. is a very fundamental pedagogical re, uh, approach. You learn from a master, you imitate the master, you replicate the master, whether it's in oratory or in surgery, and then you go off, you go off on your own. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we did. And then you could talk about some of the same kind of masters that you're looking on in terms of developing um, your particular take in terms of Shaker, or George Nakashima. Well, this is, again, this is the idea of a derivative form. Nakashima, who, uh, out of New Hope, Pennsylvania, uh, it was a master at understatement, at, in, at infusing uh, sort of a Japanese aesthetic to much of what he was doing. And he took something like the simple Shaker uh, Deacon's Bench, which was their interpretation of a, of a somewhat formulaic form, and he did what is on the right. Uh, and I mean, I was overwhelmed by Nakashima's work, and if anybody had an influence uh, on us over the years, it's George Nakashima's and his approach to adaptation, how he took from the past, put in a, brought something new to it, and a synthesis came about, which is uniquely George Nakashima. At that time, nobody was doing live-edged furniture. Now, it's all over the place. Yep. And again, sort of the idea of the Windsor chair continue with the uh, hoop back. And then Jeff, sort of some of the transformations that went on within, um, with Jeff Parsons here, uh, Bruce, what transformations have been going on with you all um, over the time as well? Well. Uh, <clears throat> thank you again. Um, <clears throat> where's that clicker? 
as, as I mentioned in, uh, just a bit ago, we, we did, uh, uh, we actually had the, the, the presence of mind to make a mission statement when we, we began our partnership, which was this idea of bringing the production uh, sensibility, um, or bringing our studio craftsman sensibility forward into this production uh, methodology. And um, our first uh, foray into that was uh, also a recognition that we, we were working in a place, a, a really, I think like Tom uh, conveyed, we, we felt that same kind of uh, uh, connection with the place that we worked. Um, uh, across the uh, Lake Champlain in the Adirondacks, there was this great uh, uh, form of outdoor furniture, the Adirondack chair that we actually uh, used as our first foray into production. We, we, uh, we produced a, many of these things out of Atlantic cedar. Our shop was primitive. Um, in fact, we had no dust collection and after about the first week of uh, uh, putting these first group of pieces together, neither Jeff nor I could smell cedar at all. <laughs> Uh, I can again, fortunately. It's one of my favorite uh, fragrances of, of wood. But um, uh, we've uh, continued with this um, uh, model of making uh, production pieces. Um, our role in it uh, today is more in the intellectual end of things. We, we do the design work. We organize the means by which these uh, pieces get produced. Um, uh, we do the client contact, in this case, uh, Middlebury College, uh, who sort of trained us in a, in, in a, in a certain way in uh, how to understand an institution's ethos and to offer them something more than a durable uh, uh, object that serves a purpose, but rather something that conveys their uh, principles and really, in a certain uh, way, the values of their the education that they aspire to put forward. So uh, this is a group of chairs um, that went into their library. Uh, we made several hundred of these. In fact, we did this all in Vermont uh, with a group of uh, manufacturers utilizing a, a great f a furniture parts uh, manufacturer in the northeast part of our state. Um, uh, did assembly in another uh, shop that had some CNC joint cutting equipment that we sort of, Jeff and I took turns working there through the, the summer we made this group. Um, they, the, they, uh, uh, these pieces began <clears throat> with uh, trees uh, on the Breadloaf campus, which is up in the hills above Middlebury College. Middlebury's sort of in the Champlain Valley and uh, they have woodlands up above in the uh, uh, uplands. And so uh, these trees were made from their maple, uh, these pieces were made from their maple trees. Uh, we were able to um, uh, use a nearby production sawmill, and I think we processed about uh, 20 to 30,000 feet of wood for the furniture that we made and also uh, flooring that was used in that building and other places in, in the campus. Uh, we used a sawmill that sawed that in one day. Um, <clears throat> uh, there were also tables involved. Um, so uh, this also uh, trained us not only in the uh, our, our art of listening to a client, but um, uh, also in uh, coordinating uh, different businesses and um, l learning about who was really good at doing what. And uh, so at this point we've developed a series of people that we like to work with, uh, which has uh, produced a, a flexibility in our, in our scale. Um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Well, I'm being cognizant of the amount of time. Um, we have tried to address issues of, um, of production, um, the suggestion of marketing, outreach, um, business philosophies that have evolved over time 
certainly what you have a sense of is sort of what Tom had talked about, sort of that resistance to profit, resistance to business practices, in essence, um, that some of the furniture makers uh, might have uh, undertaken early on, and sort of this real sense of practicality um, of that awareness of the marketplace of you know, Tom's catalog and showroom um, kinds of work, of Bruce and Jeff's um, use of marketing surveys, of going out and testing people's reactions to character wood. Um, I encourage you to try to get a chance to talk to them after the program. Um, that, you know, there are many different things we could go into the subtleties of it, but knowing that we need to keep moving along with our allotted 45 minutes, um, we should probably um, segue into the demonstrations at this point. So I wanted to thank Tom and Bruce very much for sharing their careers with us. Uh, good. I'm Ethan Lasser from the Chipstone Foundation. We're moving now into our uh, live demonstrations with Al Breed and Matthias Plesnig, and then the three of us will, will, will sit down together and uh, talk, talk tools and technology. So first over to Al. This on? There we go. Um, before I start carving, I'd like to actually just say that what I'll be doing is, is carving a portion of this bed, which was actually Duncan Fife's bed, his own bed. And uh, before I get started, they, we did a little bit of video of me actually turning the blank that I'll be carving. And so we're going to show that now uh, before I get started carving. I'm shaping the vase with a gouge. coming from each side into the low spot. This is the skew chisel and this will take the last few little bits of the gouge tool marks away. Most of this will be carved away so it's just the flow of it that needs to look good. And now I can take it off the lathe and start carving. So that's the, uh, that's the initial preparation of this piece that I'll be carving on here. And I mean, the, I think the important thing to realize is that this required the, the technique of a lot of different craftspeople. So there were turners, carvers, gilders, and so forth. But I'm just going to briefly do a little carving on this piece here just to give you an idea of the process, because I think process is really important with these pieces. You have to realize they were actually made by people's hands. And so I have a section of, the, uh, of, his, of a, a mock-up of his bedpost. This is the piece I, I just turned. And this is a, a very stylized leaf, a, you know, call it a water leaf. And uh, Fife's work is pretty uh, specific as far as his style goes. And, um, on this piece, we've got a turned vase form and then leaves that, that uh, just cling on to this vase all the way around. And what I've done is I've, I've carved some of this already. There's a central rib down the middle. And then I'm going to carve the, the stylized leaves on either side of it. The tools I'm using are the, the tools I always use. They're, they're a combination between modern and antique carving tools. And uh, sometimes I use a mallet, sometimes I just push them by hand. I'll just push these by hand, I think. Uh, this is mahogany. And so I've laid out these, these leaves, and now I have to uh, create the, the, the separation between the leaves by making these cuts. So I'm coming up here. It's also helpful in these situations to be able to carve with both hands because the grain will switch from side to side on you. And instead of continually turning the piece around, you just have to switch hands. This is one of the, one of the things that I learned as, a, as an intern at the Museum of Fine Arts years ago. I worked under an, a, a master Italian cabinet maker, and the only thing he ever told me about carving was these guys were ambidextrous. <laughs> and so, from the very beginning, I started using two hands, and it really has paid off in the long run. And I try to get my students to do it, too, usually with a great deal of resistance, but um, it's, some, it's pretty surprising what you can actually do. So carving also involves a lot of drawing. 
because as you carve, you remove your marks. And so you have to keep putting stuff back. And sort of the basic tenets of carving are that you're creating, trying to create something that doesn't look like wood anymore, is one of them. The other one is that you're pushing these various shaped tools through the wood and you're trying to create curved surfaces really with no visible junctions between the curves. So when I'm done, you shouldn't really see many carving tool marks. You should really just see the finished product, which is easier said than done, but that's what I try to concentrate on. That was just using a V-shaped tool, and now I'm going to use a gouge, which is rounded. And I'm going to separate these elements. Sorry about that. This is, mahogany is good for carving because, oh, I think I just knocked my mic out. Is that still working? Um, mahogany is good for carving because it's very fine-grained. It's fairly predictable, and it takes a gorgeous finish when you're done. Um, it's hard, but uh, you want hard wood for carving to a certain extent because it can take the detail that you put into it. What I'm doing here is I'm always resting my hand on the work, and that gives me a pivot point to do that with. You can't carve up in the air like this with your hands just floating around. You have to be down close to the work, and you have to anchor your hands on the work to get that control. I'm really putting a lot of power into these cuts, but I have to control them, so I'm always resting my hands as much as I can right on the work. So here I've taken out the spaces between these leaves, except for this one. And this is called carving in the round when you're carving on a, a turned element. So I've taken those spaces out between these leaves, and now I'm going to just deepen a couple of them, and then take a fairly flat gouge and round them over, like this. And I'm thinking of an imaginary center line in here, and I'm trying to make my cut go from my center line here all the way to the bottom of that V cut that I just made. That way we can get a nice continuous surface with no evident transition between the different cuts, hopefully. And carving, of course, was a very specific, specialized trade. So a big shop like Fife's would have would have many carvers who were specialists doing this work. It's all they did day in, day out for decades is carve. And that's why this stuff looks so good. Um, nowadays, we're sort of, someone like me in a small shop is relying more on you know, our own skills rather than farming stuff out, although I do farm some things out. So I'm trying to round these over. So I've rounded over all the tops, almost. The tool will do this for me and give me a nice surface if I pick up the right tool. And now I'm going to do the other side. Coming up from below here. You've always got to be aware of the grain of the wood. This stuff is three-dimensional. It descends down into the wood. And if you don't understand the structure of the wood, uh, you'll end up taking off big chips, which, you know, that's what glue is for, but... <laughs> but uh, the last thing you really want to do is stop and re-glue things. It's just too slow. So you try to get it right the first time. It'll also make a distinctive noise when I'm going the wrong way. It'll start clicking and snapping. And that's the little alarm that says, turn around, go the other way. And so I've tried to round these off a bit. The other thing you want when you're carving is a single source of light. So I'm usually carving in front of a window. And uh, I've actually had shops where I've moved around from window to window as the day progressed because the light just would keep changing on me. Um, you don't want north light like an artist because that, then you don't get any shadows at all, hardly. But I like a nice raking light coming across the work. And so that's mostly there. I was 
going to clean these up a little bit. Like this to emphasize these marks. Divide this up a little bit. You have to remember that these guys, say in five shop, would be blindingly fast at this. Uh, when you do this all day, it just becomes second nature. You don't think about the grain. Everything you just is programmed in. And so it's actually more difficult for me to try to figure this stuff out without a master to teach me. Though there are places now where you can go and learn, but uh, being self-taught, it's one of those things that you have to learn the hard way sometimes. I'm just gonna polish the top of these off and then my time's probably gonna be up. How are we doing for time? Anybody know? Almost done. All right, how's that look? Not too bad. Um, and so the tools that I've used here, really just a couple of them. I use my V-tool, I use this gouge, and um, ideally on some of these smaller spaces, I would take a gouge that's a little curvier than that last one and clean up some of this stuff. You're looking for the perfect tool for the element that you're doing. That's why I've probably got 350 carving tools back at the shop but a lot of them just sit around most of the time and gather dust until that one time when you need it. And then you grab it and it's the perfect, perfect tool for the job. I'm just gonna clean these up a little bit. So I just wanted you to get the, get, understand the process. And so it involves taking hand tools, pushing them through this hard mahogany, and just with your experience, really, and your, um, your knowledge of the material, uh, you learn how to sort of make this stuff behave. Um, and looking at the old work, whenever you look at old carving, just think about that thing just started as a hunk of wood and ended up as a flower or whatever it is, um, just through the skill of the carver and his understanding of the materials. Let's clean this up a little bit. Um, they did use abrasives to a certain extent, but not, nothing like that a lot of people use nowadays. The abrasives then would be shark skin or glass paper. And you would just, in carving, you hardly do it at all. But on some stuff, you, you just touch it with that just to take some of the, the high points off. But uh, really, the finish that you get off a carving tool can't be improved. It's very, very, very fine and smooth and actually comes out polished when you're done. And so it, uh, you know, a good carver, um, really, you, you don't go back and sand it to to create anything, but just take, take maybe a few sharp points off and that's it. So I'll stop there and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Matthias who's going to uh, give you another demonstration. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthias and um, I'm gonna do a little demonstration of 3D modeling on the computer and um, I'm a furniture designer and builder, and when I first started building the kind of furniture I build today, um, I, I built a boat before I really started building the furniture. And when I built this boat, um, I was also learning 3D modeling, and they work serendipitously together now with my furniture and the computer, are, they work hand in hand. Um, so I'm gonna show you basically how I, how, how I use the computer to, to make one of my forms. Um, this is a piece of mine, a piece of furniture in the very beginning stages. And I'll go back to these images at the end of the demonstration so you can see the, the relationship here. This is a very early stage of a very large piece of furniture. And this is when it's halfway finished. And this is right about the time for ready for finish. This is all handmade. The computer isn't used for any of this except for the, the very, very initial visualization of the geometry. So, at this stage of the piece, the computer is completely put away, and I don't refer back to it at all. It's completely collecting dust. Um, the, the computer only comes out when I'm trying to think of a new piece to make. And that's, that's very important, the way that they stay separated. So, um, um, okay, so this is, this is a program called Rhinoceros. And to, I'll kind of explain the main layout of the program. This is this window on the top left is the top view. This is the front view. This is the right view, and this is perspective view of your model. 
And it's basically a CAD program that you can zoom in and out infinitely, um, and you can spin models around in the perspective. And I'm using a, a little MacBook Pro here. This isn't the fastest computer for this, but it'll, it'll work for this. Um, and essentially, the, the, the way that I use uh, Rhinoceros is a method that's been used in paper for centuries in the world of boat building, which is the uh, lofting, which used to be a very complex uh, uh, trade to learn. And now with computer technology and with, with, uh, with math crunching processors, it's extremely fast. So I just drew these three lines here uh, yesterday on, on the computer and separated them. Uh, just to show you, just to show you really quickly how these, how these, how these contours, when their relationships are translated to one another, it makes a surface. And so that, that's basically the surface that those lines would make, right? And that, that's very, very fast, and it happens instantly on the computer. Doesn't need to even think about it. And with this, with this surface here, I can slice this thing up however I want to and draw information from it, um, and it has. Uh, infinite amount of curves coming from this, this very first to the very last. There's an infinite amount of lines going through there that are always changing, that are all that are all different. You know, so I can I can select any of those out of this model. Um, so that's that. So that's basically how how this how this relates to boat building and how I took this and basically decided to make boats that were on crack, that where I could I could make these things. If I, if I can make this out of wood, why can't you make anything you want out of wood? Anything that I can make with this process of lofting. You know, if, if you can make it out of wood, if you can make a boat like that, you can make anything. Um, so I'm going to switch to okay. So uh, I've already got these lines drawn on here. I fear I didn't really want to waste the time drawing these, so we had more time to play around with this. But um, these are lines that I drew yesterday, and so this line here, I hope it shows up red. Um, that's the really basic ergonomic measurements of seating. The really basic, just like the seat height, the seat depth, the seat back angle, and the height of the back, and the clearance for your feet on the bottom. So you can put, tuck your feet underneath your, your leg, so it's below your, directly below your knee. Uh, those measurements are plugged into the computer, and then I basically draw a curve around those measurements so that that's a locked in. Uh, Somewhere in the benches that I make, there's that perfect ergonomic, and then, and then, or at least the supposedly German perfect ergonomic, and then everything outside of that is a morph into something else, which gives you, you know, numerous seating positions and comfort levels and uh, this and that. Okay, so then this other line here would be more of a low, like maybe it looks like a low seating area, really low lounge area, um, and uh, this one here is just a blah and a blah. So you know, these are just forms I'm just going to kind of uh, draw. A, Okay, so this is the front view, so I'll get out of there. Okay, so now if you look over at this perspective view here, and keep your eyes on that. If I take, if I take one of these curves and I just decide to uh, to separate it out here, and then I can take okay, this piece and separate it out here. Okay, so if I just did this, for instance, now there's a relationship, a spatial relationship of these curves, right? And I can start to pull them around and. Maybe make them, um, let's see. Okay, so this is, this is essentially, this has become my form of sketching now, which before I, I love to draw in the sketchbook and I've always, I've always loved the sketchbook, but, um, but more and more the computer has become my ultimate sketchbook. And it's because of this, like the fact that I can, I can basically tell after drawing these, these curves, I can give these guys a spatial relationship to one another. Um, whatever you can really th dream of, in a way. I mean, this, this is just this looks a lot like one of my benches, but it's you know these curves could be anything. Um, and once I tell these things to be uh, to have a, a surface that makes the translation, the computer immediately does it, and I can basically view a 3D model of it. That's so that's basically uh, somewhere in this in this area here. There's there's the seating line right there, and so that's like that's where the main bench would be. There's my other line for the low seating, and then there's my ends that I that I made right. And so with, with this, you know, you can imagine that it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty infinite how you can arrange these things and what what their arrangements are. Uh, 
and you know you, you can completely change this entire geometry with those same with those same lines. I could you know I could uh, mm, you could just you could really throw these things way out of whack, and the computer still won't you know it's not going to hesitate to to connect them. So it's a little bit, it's a lot different, but it's a, okay, so that's, so that's the, basic, the basic premise of, of lofting and making crazy forms, toothpaste forms with lofting, which is great, right? Like, okay, so you look at this thing and it looks like it has a Hadid bench that you can make out of plastic and rubber and foam. So my goal is basically to make use a natural material like wood to, to make these forms. I don't think you really need space age materials to build furniture. I, I like using space age uh, machines just because it makes me really excited about a material that is an ancient material and really brings it into the contemporary world in another language. But um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't use any, any woods from outside of my state and I don't use any uh, materials that are um, uh, you know, resin based or anything, except for my glue. <laughs> um, okay, so this, is a, so this is a piece that's basically uh, rendered out. And so normally that, that skin surface that I made earlier, that's a way for me to explore concepts and to explore geometries and to, uh, you know, to really work with, if, if a client needs something for a specific space, I can build a model like that inside of an architectural model on the computer and I can use it for proposal purposes. But often they want something that's more detailed and I like to see something more detailed sometimes because you want to see how the, how the, the wood strips could flow around the, uh, the form and this and that. And also keep in mind like the, the curves that I draw in that last demo, those curves, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about how much I can bend the wood. I use steam bending to bend all my wood and um, I know when it breaks because of breaking it I mean, many times. So I believe in building an actual cutting yourself, you know, sweating, you're using the material and really realizing when it breaks and um, how it, uh, how it reacts. So this is a piece that's actually, this piece uh, is a completely built piece that, in, in the computer at least, that is similar to that, that demo model that I did. And I can, uh, I can erase the different elements that I've built on the, on the piece, on the model. So it's totally exploratory. I can, I can you know, take it all apart. I can select that rib and you know, I can do whatever I want. Um, as I said, I don't use this when I'm actually building the piece, though, so this is just kind of a neat feature. And that's basically the model. And a lot of these curves are from, uh, if, if you look at these curves down here where the, the rib kind of comes and it curls, curves back out, that's from making previous pieces that didn't have enough structural integrity. And the, the, these pieces needed to have more structural integrity, so when I added this little recurve on the bottom, it made the piece very, very rigid, very strong. Uh, yeah. so, so that's that. And now there's an app for the iPhone and the iPad to actually view Rhino models on your, on your iPhone and iPad. And you don't need the Rhinoceros program, you just need the app. And basically I can send a client the, the 3D model, which is usually is less than a megabyte in size, and they can spin it around and zoom in and out and take a picture of it at a certain view and then send it back to me if they have notes. It's a really interesting thing, and one more thing. So that's basically a 3D, a 3D model that's rendered, and with, with lighting effects and shadows. And that's the front view. And so basically this is what I was doing on the computer, you know, like the, the drawing those lines are those plywood sections. And then the long lines that are that are that are connecting those sections are the translation from one section to the other. And that's it. And good for you all out there for staying for this last panel, which is really going to take us to the basics, to tools, to making, to process. Um, give yourself some time after we talk to go through the show and you'll have new eyes, I think, to take to all the Fife's, to Fife's objects to see what went into them, where they came from, um, how they went from tree to finished product. Where's my clicker? So I'm going to go back to this image, which we all, we all know well. You've seen it in each of the other panels. Fife's shop there on 
Fulton Street in 1817. And I, I put it up here both to tell you um, kind of where we've gone so far and where we're going. Uh, um, so, so Ned and Tom and Bruce took us in here into the retail space. There's Fife. This is the vignette uh, at the entrance to the show. There's Fife. Um, closing the sale, we hope, right? With two women, there are a couple chairs in the audience. Seems like quite a smooth operator, um, and no doubt a really uh, nice shop space inside. We're not sure where the designers from our first panel worked, but in the attic, yeah, yeah. I'm t well, we're going into the attic. But it's, it's interesting to note that there's a group of men coming out of here, and I, Peter speculates in the book that maybe those are kind of journeymen, top brass workers in the shop. Maybe these windows were where they sketched and built prototypes. But now, since you all stuck around, we are going backstage, up, right, down. Uh, noisy, dusty, dirty, smelly, sawdust-ridden spaces. Uh, none of this daintiness anymore um, for the next conversation. We're going up into the world of this figure here, figure without a jacket on, in working clothes taking a break from something. The skylight up here suggests, as um, Al was just talking to us about working with light, that it is some kind of making space, the workshop space. Um, there's a myth out there that there are a hundred craftsmen who worked in, in five shops. So here's one of them being caught uh, taking a break from whatever he's doing. So what I, I want to talk about is the world of that figure, his skills, his tools, um, what's in his repertoire, really. And then, you know, what, what's... What's the difference, what's the same about what, what a figure like that would have done and what makers do today? So I'm um, privileged to be up here with two people to help take us through that, right? That 200 years of woodworking. And as in the last um, panels, I'm going to introduce both and then uh, we'll have them talk briefly about their own work and then go to Fife and, and, and show some pictures. So. Um, you know a bit about Al and Matthias already. Um, Matthias was trained at RISD and then went out to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, where I'm from, Packer country to all those giants <laughs> or fans out there. A downtrodden place these days. Uh, I, <laughs> a crestfallen place. And uh, Matthias uses uh, techniques from the field of, of boat building to create the sculptural forms that we've seen. He's now based in Philadelphia. His work is out there, published. It's in several museum collections, the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, um, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Uh, Al, who you saw at the bench, um, is a, a, a maker, scholar, and teacher who's been thinking about restoring and, and reproducing early American furniture for, for some time, since I think 1977, and uh, even before. Uh, Al has been, uh, has written widely, uh, lectured widely, and he now runs uh, the Breed School for Carving and Cabinet Making uh, in New Hampshire. So I'm gonna pass this first to Al. Show us some. So we have our clicker here. All right, so what I'd like to do first is to just uh, speak a little bit about, oh, I'll keep, there, you there we go. go. Yeah. Okay, you can see we are a little bit different in what we do. <laughs> but that's, that's good. Uh, what I do is I've ended up uh, being known for copying eight, 17th, 18th, early 19th century furniture. And uh, I just brought a little selection of pieces and a little bit of process to show you too because the process is really important to me. This is a pair of eight chairs that we made in the shop. And right now the shop consists of myself and my son Sam who's 23. Uh, we did these for the Goddard family when they sold their originals uh, several years ago at Sotheby's. These are, these are John Goddard corner chairs. We used mahogany that was uh, really great early type mahogany and actually the leather on these was from a shipwreck that went down in 1789. So it's actually the original type of leather that it would have been uh, on the original chairs, which is kind of crazy. This is a reproduction of uh, the John Elliott chair, which, is, which was uh, made for John Elliott who who was, uh, they called him the preacher to the Indians uh, in uh, Roxbury in the 1600s. That's a copy of the original that I did. There's a, there's a sort of a contrast between a couple of the different chairs I've done recently. And uh, we've got the Elliott chair on the right and a, a federal lolling chair that's in the Gardner Pingree House, the collections of the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. Um, so my work does span quite a, a range here. I'm going, going through it 
fairly chronologically, this is a copy of a Gaines chair that was made in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, originally about 1720. Um, I love that chair. It's actually extremely comfortable. It's a real sort of medieval transition here, but uh, my goal here was to make it look like an original, so I wore it down a little bit. And uh, Also, the trick here is not to overwork this stuff. If it's early work and it wasn't super highly finished originally, I try not to do that in my copy so that you have the same feel. Uh, again, here's an early piece, a copy of a 1674 uh, chest from um, Salem, Massachusetts. A uh, later piece here, from the, this is a copy of one from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston uh, called the Turreted Tea Table. One of the first ball and cloth, I think the first ball and cloth foot I ever carved is on that table. Um, and there's a, a more recent and different version of a Newport Tea Table made several of these over the years. This is, I think, one of my latest ones, a real icon of American uh, furniture design as far as sort of what they didn't do. Uh, they left a lot alone, and I think it's what makes it successful here. Uh, Pennsylvania Spice cabinet, little small tabletop cabinet. I do quite a bit of architectural work. Uh, this is an interior of a, a chimney breast that I did for a house in Concord, Massachusetts, and I designed and carved all this applied carving, which was really fun. Um, this, this architectural stuff, you can get kind of carried away on this, um, which it's, it's, it's great when, they, when the customer says, go nuts, you know, so. This is my version of that. Uh, the upper corner here carved. This was all carved out of basswood and then applied and then painted later. So you can carve it out of anything that carves nicely, really. Uh, a stair bracket in the same house. I designed this one with sort of the Rococo feel to it, uh, which I've been kind of getting involved in lately. I love the, the early design books and the, the whole uh, sort of crazy extreme uh, <laughs> designing that they did. And uh, this, is, this is a version of that. There's the stairway that it went on. Uh, also the spiral newel post uh, I did for that. Um, stairways are, are very complex to do. I try not to get involved in any of the math. So I let someone else figure that out and I do the decoration. So it works out well that way. That way when the newel post and the handrail don't meet, you know, it's not my fault. So. <laughs> Which happened here. <laughs> Some more architectural work. I think this really embodies what I like about working with wood and early stuff is that you take a chunk of wood and you turn it into something that doesn't look like wood anymore. And, you know, as simple as that sounds, it's really satisfying to start with a pile of stuff and end up with something that doesn't look like the raw material anymore. And it's art versus artifice. It's, uh, we're, we're just trying to fool everybody, really. Again, some details of those chairs, the, uh, the Goddard corner chairs, very sculptural stuff. A lot of times I'm a sculptor, really. Uh, there's joinery involved, and the joinery is sort of the grunt work, but the sculpting is the really fun part. And there they are again. Um, this is an eagle. I've done a lot of eagle carvings for uh, restoring pieces, and this is a McIntyre-type eagle. Uh, there's a fellow in my building who does the gessoing and the gilding, and uh, those are fun to do. This is a chest I cannot take credit for. This is, my son made this when he was 21 years old. Um, I told him the piece he made first in his career was the piece most guys make as their last piece they make. Um, so this is a serpentine front Bombay chest. Um, I've made one exactly like it, but uh, it's a great example of Rococo design. And, uh, you know, a real one will cost you a couple million dollars if you can find one. Um, and, you know, we can make pretty nice ones using good wood. And, of course, a couple pounds of silver on top of there doesn't hurt it either, you know. <laughs> If you put anything on an oriental rug and put silver on it, you know, in front of a painting, it, it looks pretty good. <laughs> Not to take anything away from Sam's work, he did a really great job on this, but uh, it's, a, it's a real lush image there. This is some carving for a, a bed made in Salem, Massachusetts uh, for Elias Derby uh, that I did. And uh, just a nice example of carving in the round. It's sort of the same idea of what I was doing here this morning, but this afternoon, but just a different style of carving. And now uh, those are ebony lyre strings inlaid in between those rows of leaves. Very distinctive style of this carver. Um, a little process here for you, because I really love process. 
And this is, um, we made a, a Newport High Boy, a John Townsend High Boy copy, and I just included some shots of that in the process of being made. This is the, the big shell down below being carved. As you can see, I've got some photographs there, some patterns and some tracings and so forth, and you put it all together and hopefully you come out with the carving. A little detail here, very typical. Uh, little loop-de-loop -loop there in the corner that Townsend did a lot. That's kind of hard to do. Uh, the knee carving is very jewel-like and uh, shallow, almost like engraving. Very, very different from the Philadelphia, or they're really deep. The Duncan, a lot of the Duncan Fife stuff we're seeing now. Um, this is very shallow, but intricate carving. Uh, this is just the process of me carving this. And it's, I call it Egyptian. I don't know what, what it deri derives from, but it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, it's probably only a sixteenth of an inch deep. Uh, it looks very deep, but it's extremely shallow, which is kind of the challenge. I think that in this case, he, uh, he picked a design and a technique and, and basically dared other people to see if they could do it. And uh, the answer w was no, not many people could do it. Little details of the foot from that piece. Um, ball and cloth feet, typical of, of John Townsend, these sort of gothic, scary looking, uh, evil, you know, Darth Vader type feet here. Again, there's the piece when it was done after we finished it, the detail of the shell, detail of the crest, the pediment. I think one of these is selling, I don't know if it's sold already at uh, Sotheby's. And uh, there it is finished. Nice restrained design. I mean, it's, uh, it's very conservative in its embellishment. It's really two boxes with uh, a few things carved on there and, and left alone, which I think is what makes it fairly successful. Here's a dwarf tall clock. I've, you know, I'll make anything anyone wants. Uh, so uh, this is fun. I like to make clocks. This is, only, this is four feet tall. And this was done for the uh, Harbor and Home exhibit for, uh, that was down at Winter Tour a couple years ago. And in my teaching, this is a, this is a clock class. Uh, I love to teach. Um, people get really excited, and I'm preaching to the choir. It's great. Uh, they come all, all ready to go. And uh, this is a clock class. These, these guys are working on their clocks. Um, some happy campers here with their clocks. <laughs> the hide glue pot, in the prominent in the right side of the bench there. And to segue, we're going to be talking about tools and, and uh, what we use these days. And so I included a few tools uh, that I use pretty regularly, some old, some new. This is a, a smoothing plane called a coffin plane. Hasn't changed in, you know, probably a thousand years, uh, but still works great. Modern equivalent, really, of that. And a Japanese saw, which I really like these a lot. These are great. High-tech, uh, thin blade. A zillion teeth per inch, impossible to sharpen, but they work great when they're new. Uh, and here's sort of a pile of, of traditional tools that I use all the time. Um, hand saws, chisels, spoke shaves, uh, planes, various marking devices, uh, scrapers. So, I mean, the tools that I use really haven't changed that much. I use some modern stuff, but I can really get by. You know, if the power went out, I could still make my furniture, uh, which I sort of like that idea. Uh, even though, of course, we, we always rely on, on power tools, but, uh, but there is that capability of, uh, of working for weeks on end sometimes without using any power tools, which I really like. Uh, maybe yeah, a few more carving tools. As I said, I've got hundreds of these things, and uh, they're all different shapes and sizes, depending on, of course, the job that I'm doing. Um, but here's an example of a, of a carving and, and some of the tools I use doing that. And uh, the other thing that the, uh, the old cabinet maker I used to work for told me that the whole thing with carving is economy of cuts. And so the fewer cuts you can use to create your effect, the better. And so I'm always trying to keep that in mind. And uh, that's, the foot, that's the leg of that high boy when it was done. Um, if you ever want to find me, just myname.com. Uh, that's it. Okay. All right. So, um, 
this, this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, okay, so this is a large piece that, that I, I, I don't know why this is in the beginning of the, of the slides, but um, I, the, the process that I use allows me to really kind of dictate where people sit when the, when the pieces are in the, in the space. So this piece in particular was designed for the client who wanted, he had, he had a specific space with a bar in one place, an entrance and an exit on opposite sides of the room, and he wanted people to conjure around, congregate around certain areas of the bench and be able to sit and look out the window from one side and this and that. And that's where a lot of these forms are influenced by the client's desires of, of the interior space. And um, when these are built, they're completely built by hand, by me, and sometimes one other person, or sometimes two other people if it's a really large scale, really large scale piece. Um, everything is steam bent uh, white oak, and all of the white oak is, uh, it's all air dried white oak from local sum, uh, sawmills. I can't use uh, lumber from a regular lumber yard because they often kill and dry their wood in a furnace and they dry it as fast as they can to turn a good profit. Um, air dried wood takes anywhere from a year to three years for it to dry correctly. Um, and that's the only stuff that can steam bend. You can't, you can't steam bend um, kiln dried wood. So um, the outside is completely sanded and shipped with chisels to get all the glue out and there's joints every, every four ribs. Um, and the inside is completely sanded smooth and scraped. So my main, my main tools are chisels, scrapers, and block planes for, um, for hand tools and Japanese saws. The one that Alan showed is actually the same exact saw that I have and you have to keep a collection of blades because once the blades start going bad yeah. on them, it's just they go. But, but they're cheap to replace and they're excellent, excellent thin blades. Um, so yeah, so I still use a lot of block planes, chisels, and scrapers are probably my biggest tool for cleaning up the pieces. And um, scrapers are basically uh, just a little, a little plate of steel, uh, of hardened steel. And you just put a little burr on one edge of, of that piece of steel and you can, you can flex it and scrape the, uh, the wood and shavings come up just like you're using a plane. Um, uh, so yeah, so I have a little collection of block planes, big collection of scrapers and a really big collection of chisels. And then of course I have power tools. And, that's necessary. So this is the same piece in the in the the client's home. And I don't have like this bench. You know, it's it's 18 feet long from end to end. Uh, if you just draw a rectangle around it, but if you if you follow the curve, it's about 27, 28 feet. And I, I don't have wood that's 28 feet long. So all these pieces of wood are scarfed uh, along. So you, if you follow one of those one of those lines, you can see a little like a knife edge where it comes, like there's one right there and um, it looks like a triangle, but that's uh, it's two pieces of wood that are joined together at a really sharp angle at a certain ratio so that it's equivalent to just gluing two pieces of wood together. Um, it's the simplest, fastest joint for um, basically stretching wood. And that was, that was the, this is when I first started really getting into rendering for clients, like where I could make a, make a 3D model of this thing, of that bench you just saw, and give this to the client. They could look at it and, and you know, tell me what they, what they if, if it's a green light or if, they, if they'd like for me to change something or um, whatever, you know. Uh, this is the first time I really proposed something to a client using the computer. And I learned a lot about it. The, the entire 3D model of his house was in the computer because the firm that built the, his house used the same program I used to make my, my furniture. And this is an older piece. This piece is called Providence. This is when I really started. This is before that previous piece. This isn't in chronological order. Right? Just kind of Thurman. This is when I first started seeing wood as a landscape. I can make this into like a meshed landscape that you can sit in. So when, when you sit in it, the, the body is not just on this piece of furniture. It's in the furniture. And when you look around you, you feel like you're in a, in a valley. Computer model. That's the computer model from the uh, earlier. And sketching is still a very, very big part of my process. Um, I, I was, uh, lately I've kind of gone away from sketching. The, the architects can't really see the sketches, so I, I, it's hard for me to formulate my ideas with, uh, with a sketchbook. But at this point I was really doing a lot of computer work and printing out really tiny thumbnails of my computer models and putting them in my sketchbook so they were working together in the sketching process and the development of the concepts. Uh, different structure system, and that's one of more recent pieces. 
and this is taking a lot of the, a lot of the information from previous work into a really small package. So this is a really small, extremely strong. So most of these pieces are like are, are solid like a rock. They're extremely power. The, the the curves, the compound curves, give it a really really powerful strength. That's the inside of this piece. Um, this is actually in New York City. This is on 29th and First Avenue, and there's two of them. And each one is 27 feet long. And so, like the inside of this, you know, when I'm working on the inside of this, is, people will say it must be horrible on the inside sanding these things. But I believe the inside and outside should be equally as sanded. Um, but it's amazing. It feels like you're in a cathedral inside. It feels like a, you're inside of an architecture. And these are just computer models for for different proposals. I wish we had uh, Duncan, Duncan himself up here reacting to these guys, giving Al a hard time for not reproducing his stuff, <laughs> going for those old skills, and no doubt he would be totally blown away by what you're making. He, Comes he outside, had. you know, he, he, he read about things like that in the Bible, but that was probably as close as he came. Uh, this is what we have of Fife, though. This is one of the great objects um, in the show. Go, at, go, go and look at it. It's his, it's his tool chest, um, and... Uh, the count I read is there are over 300 tools inside of this, and um, here's another detail. So it's got, it's got this really flashy interior. It's a pine box, but it has these mahogany veneer drawer fronts, ivory handles. Most of Fife's tools probably would have come from England, Sheffield, Birmingham, and then maybe he made handles for them. We had a debate over lunch about something this big. I mean, did he use this? Did he use these tools? Did it move around with him? Um, we learned that he may have built it at the beginning of his career and then uh, extended it, right, uh, later on at his retirement, and then it survives in his family. So I want Alan, Matthias, just to take us through sort of what they see here and um, what, what, what kind of tools are, are still around and, w and which aren't. So either of you guys take that up. Yeah. All right, I'll go first. <laughs> Um, well, as you saw from some of my tools, we definitely, his toolkit and my toolkit definitely overlap. Um, just the type of work that I'm doing, uh, what I've discovered is that if you uh, start with the same toolkit they used and use the same methods, you have a better chance of showing up with the same result. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the tools that are in here, this is pretty much the... Uh, sort of the ultimate leather man for the cabinet maker, you know. It's, there's everything in here, and, and uh, I mean, what cabinet makers used to do is what, when they would uh, go through their apprenticeship, a lot of times, I, I believe in the, in the agreement, the, the part of it was that they were to be furnished with a set of tools uh, when they went out into the, the world as a journeyman, and so, uh, to a certain extent, that's the basis of this toolkit. I mean, I haven't taken it apart exactly and looked at everything, but there are certain elements in here that you'll find in every toolkit. You've got measuring tools, you've got um, cu cutting tools, planing tools, saws, drills, um, and you know layout tools. There are compasses, dividers. But th this is a, this is a pretty extreme uh, toolkit, but um, it's it's really uh, it's it's essentially I've probably got one of everything in there in my shop. Uh, the exact same stuff. I mean the stuff. Uh, as Ethan said, it came from Sheffield. Uh, the, the weren't, there wasn't that much of a tool manufacturer here in this country until later. And, uh, and so we're all dealing really with the same toolkit. I mean, you can find the same brands, the same exact hardware, the same, uh, you know, the exact same models of drill bits and bit braces and so forth. And so, you know, as far as what I do in the modern world, I can live with that toolkit. Although, as I said, you know, my apprentice is the, is the machine room. So uh, when I go to take a, a two-inch board and smooth it, um, although I could do it with a, the with a smoothing plane, you know, I'd rather save time, go over to the power tools, get that thing nice, even two inches thick, rip it up into the sizes I need with a power saw, and then, I, and then I go at it with the hand tools after that. So even though the stuff I end up producing, everything you see and touch will have been done with a hand tool, the underneath of it, the, the original cuts that I made could have been made by a machine, uh, but the only cut you see is the last cut. 
Um, so that's what I tell my carving students too. But you know, if you take a machine plain board and hit it with a, a you know a hand tool, it looks just like a board 200 years ago that was plain to the hand tool. So, uh, so I guess you know his toolkit is really my toolkit as far as what I do. Um, although you know I use some modern modern hand tools like the you know the Japanese saw that we both use. Uh, there are certain things that you can definitely improve upon. This is not the ultimate last answer in hand tools. Um, there's some modern stuff that's better than this. Um, and so, you know, we all have the degree to which we adhere to the, you know, as far as people who do what I do, we all use hand tools and machine tools in different percentages, and we have big, long discussions about it. But, um, you know, this is a really, this is a really interesting set of tools, if only what it tells us about Fife, you know, mm -hmm. that he was definitely into tools. You know, whether he used all these or not every day, I, I sort of doubt after a quick look at them. But uh, it's certainly a complete set. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we, we did learn that he's sort of this master, master marketer and retailer, so there, there's some argument that, yeah, these tools were used, but the chest may have functioned as a, a kind of symbol in the shop. Matthias, do you have a take on whether Fife was in here every day? Uh, no, I, I really don't think that Fife was, Fife was in the shop. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, he had, a, he had his own shop in the back of his house um, that I, I think in the records in New York, right, they, he had a shop back there. And I, I think that this toolbox is probably back there. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I'm, not, I'm not completely familiar about the, that history of, of, the, of cabinet makers, but I don't think that the guy was in the shop all the time. I think in the beginning, maybe, you know, when he was younger, I think he was in the shop um, more often. But I think as, as time went on, I think he really um, became more of a real estate guru and really uh, couldn't be bothered being in the dust. But, <laughs> but you know, but I, I think it's interesting that a lot of, a lot of these tools are still you know, if you go to any um, schools of, uh, that have wood shops, any university, uh, art schools, um, carving schools, anything like this, these, shop, these tools are really, most of these tools are really, really common. I mean, the things that have really changed are the saws um, and some of the tools that have been kind of replaced by things like routers, and router bits, and shapers. Um, so, like, he has uh, over 60 planes in this thing, right? Right. Yeah. And so, like, a lot of those planes would be... Um, I'm assuming they'd be like molding planes, wouldn't they? I mean, they would be to put profiles. Yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of them would be. Yeah, like molding. Okay, so, so that kind of thing would be replaced by maybe routers or shapers. But you look at like the marking, the marking gauges are exactly the same as what you find today. You know, it's, I'm sure his, his chisels are in there somewhere. And he's got a collection of gouges. All those things are still used today. Alan was using them over there. Um, but even if you go to a regular shop, you'll see all these gouges and chisels hanging on the wall. So it's cool That's to see that. So I, I did some detective work and found some other other toolboxes circa 2012. Al's on the, uh, a bit messier than Fife there. Al's on the left. And uh, this is Matthias. This isn't a chest, but this is your studio on the right. So um, we can talk about, I mean, you, you all are saying how, how similar things are. And there's not many other industries out there where you'd see the same kit of tools 200 years later. Um, Matthias, tell us, Matthias, tell us what's in, uh, um. what we're looking at. Okay, yeah. so yeah, so the picture on the right is my studio, and um, it's a little nook where I have my bench and my um, I have a toolbox that I made years ago on the wall that holds all my hand tools, and it does close up so I can carry it around, but I've never I only do that when I have to you know, remove my studio to a new location. Um, I don't take it with me anywhere, other than that. But um, but yeah, so you see a whole row of chisels there, and then there's some marking tools on the right, and there's some hand planes that are scattered around, mostly block planes, and uh, hand saws hanging on the wall. Next to that, um, I I learned at a really early in my education to take care of my hand tools. Um, uh, at RISD, when you first come there, the, their first task is to sharpen your chisels and take care of your uh, take take care of your tools. I mean, it's it's extremely diligent about um, taking care of your tools. Thanks to Mr. John Dunnigan, who was my professor uh, first semester at RISD. Um, so I've always taken really great pride in my in my, in my hand tools. Uh, but then on my workbench, you can see I have my laptop there, and the laptop, uh, you know, it's 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 always somewhere around me. It's it's um, you know, for whether it be for emails, for marketing, for uh, working on computer models or um, anything. But uh, it it is a pretty constant part of my part of my studio, the computer. Um, on the right hand side, you see a tripod, and there's a little jig that I made to hold a webcam so I can do time lapse videos of processes. And um, that's basically it. I mean, also on, on the wall there, those are all the bar clamps I have. Um, I have over 3,000 C clamps for my work. 
but I only have nine bar clamps. Um, yeah, that's over to you, Alan. Well, that uh, that little jumble of, of tools there is uh, pretty much representative of my old tools that I use. Um, there's a, a small dovetail saw uh, on the bottom there with a with a paring chisel over it. So if I were going to, you know, make a case or uh, make some drawers, I would I'd be using the saw to saw out the dovetails and uh, a chisel, not exactly necessarily like that, but a chisel similar to that to to cut the t the dovetails. Um, there's a I believe that's a, a rabbit plane up on the left-hand side, and that's just used to cut sort of a, a shelf on the edge of a board. Um, again, my, uh, what else is in there? There's a square and a, a bevel gauge. And, I mean, this is all, the method that I'm making things, the method that I'm using to make things requires a lot of physical marking and then cutting on the marks that you make. And so, you know, a lot of the tools are the layout tools, so squares, marking gauges, and so forth, and the other tools are the cutting tools. And so, um, since I'm using basically the same methods that uh, someone like Fife or Townsend or Goddard or any of those guys used, um, I can really get by by using the same toolkit. And um, it's not that old tools, it's not that nowadays we can't make good tools, and there are some very good modern tools made. Uh, but a lot of the times I find that what's lacking is the, is the diversity of patterns that they had in the old tools. So there are, some carv there are a few carving tools I've got that I've never seen in any catalog anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's because when you think that, if you think of the time in which these guys were working in the 18th century, let's say, um, everything was done by hand. You know, making furniture by hand was not so romantic. You were just making furniture. <laughs> you know, nowadays, people like to sit around and get all romantic about you know, the wonder of working with your hands. Well, you know, really, it's not that romantic most of the time, you know, and, <laughs> and, and uh, but, but getting back to where I started was, if everyone's making thing, everything by hand in your society, there's an incredible array of tools that are being produced. You know, and in Sheffield, there are tool catalogs, carving tool catalogs from the early 19th century that have all kinds of stuff in them, that, and some of that stuff just doesn't get made nowadays, and it's just because there's no demand for it. And so. Sometimes I'll have to find an old tool or make a tool, which you end up having to do, uh, to do a specific uh, thing that I'm doing. And so actually when you become a craftsperson, you end up having to learn about all kinds of other associated trades. You know, like you learn about casting because you need to get things cast sometimes. You learn about steel technology because when you get a crummy scraper versus a good scraper, you sort of want to know the difference, you know, because there's definitely a difference. And, uh, you know, you learn about finishing, you learn about this and that, but um, just in the 18th century, there was an incredible array of tools. And, and the reason some of my tools were old isn't just because I like old tools, um, it's because that's the only p way I can get that specific pattern. You know, we can make actually probably way better steel now than they did then. Uh, but they made some patterns that we just don't do. So there's a little there's a little difference there. You know, some things are much better. You're better off to get a modern tool for certain things, and, and in some cases you need to use an old tool because the modern tool just isn't available. Yeah, I mean, it says something too about the, the hand, right? The ultimate tool that, for, that you need in working wood, no matter if it's 1807 or 2012. And, I, and what you're both saying is that Fife would be quite familiar with your chess and shops. So the question now is, um, you know, would you be familiar with his? Uh, walking in there to that attic, and they put you, Alan Matias, to work. Could you, could you hack it? Uh, so this is one of the great, the great objects in the show. Uh, the, the, the center table made for, more, for, for Stephen Whitney, and uh, it's kind of Fife, Fife's bling, you might say. The early history of bling in New York. Gilded surfaces, painted top, um, lots of stenciling, carving. Um, I'm going to ask Al to take us through kind of the different hands and and techniques in here. Are these, are these skills around anymore? I think you know, one of the most incredible things to me and the first time I went through the show is that the number of different trades that he had to use to get some of this furniture made. I mean, um, if I'm making a piece, um, I can pretty much do everything except cast the brass. Um, you know, I can do the finishing, I can do the carving, I can do the turning, I can do the joinery, I can do all that. Um, I've even done gilding, but you know, that's about it. 
uh, if you look at this thing, it's just, you know, forget about it. I, <laughs> I could make the frame and do the veneering and the carving, and after that, you know, you're on your own. You've got painters, gilders, uh, you know, finishers. Um, it's just, it's so lush, and it's so dependent on specialized trades, you know. Um, I, I think that the big, the huge difference between now and then is that the way we're learning how to do what we do, you know, it's, uh, this is, this is the, the sort of the, the result of a whole bunch of specialists at work, um, you know, any, any one of which would take years to figure out, and in some ways that's, that's a tough part of what we have to do nowadays as furniture makers, and an artist is that a lot of this stuff we have to figure out as we go. It uh, hasn't been done before. You know, like looking at the stuff that Matthias is doing, I mean, he's, he's, he's breaking new ground here, you know, and, and I think that uh, back then you could go down the street and there's a gilder. And you could go down the street and there's, and there's a painter, an ornamental painter, uh, someone who makes inlay, someone who saws veneers. These people were common, or, you know, they were, they were around. And nowadays, uh, you'd have to really do some looking to find the skills that, could, that you, you would need to complete that table. It it's just shows what a difference uh, sort of the, the whole uh, mechanics, artists, guilds, and societies, and so forth. It shows how advanced they were in 1820, whenever this table was made. It shows that um, you, know, you needed these specialists. You couldn't just, this wasn't a, you know, I'm building one of these in my cellar on weekends deals. Um, I think it, you make an important point too. In, in Fife's time, some of these trades were hundreds of years old, right? And they had been passed down specialist to specialist to specialist, and then something happens when they're lost. Like, take the analogy in medicine, right? Because what you're saying is it, it, it is like medicine. There's specialists in different kinds of surgery, et cetera, and that's still a tradition where things get passed down through the generations. Hopefully, we won't meet a point of break when the skills don't translate or get passed down anymore. So why, why does it stop? What happens to the system that we've lost knowledge? Technology. <laughs> How so? I, mean, yeah. I, I, think, I think machines machines first and then technology. Um, and machines, obviously, because the Industrial Revolution happened directly after, you know, it was, it was starting as Fife was uh, starting to come down. And that Really, I've really replaced a lot of tools and, and skills in the wood shop, I think, and in, in a lot of these cabinet shops, um, and just in production in general of anything in this country or and, you know, anything in the Western world. But then also, um, then you know, then you, then you've got technology that came in, and then what is now? It's now technology. I think is in its infancy with building. Um, we're just now getting over the naive state of using technology and starting to enter the more intelligent use of it. But um, but it's a similar thing. I think it's just it's it's a ongoing um, phasing out. But I have to say that right now, as technology rises up, I think the um, the respect for for making things, for especially for making things with mad skill, like and with these tools that are that are from you know a century ago, um, I think there's a growing respect for that as well. I think there's this it's this, it's this pendulum or, or teeter totter. I think that is uh, that's really interesting. I think um, I don't know. So I don't think it's ever going to die. I think we're mm -hmm. always going to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we have had periods where it's died. You know, I, like, you know, like Matthias was saying, after the Industrial Revolution, it's like everybody just wanted to see if they could make it with a machine. I mean, if you could make it with a machine, then you were ahead of the game. You know, right. it was faster, cheaper, maybe supposedly better, maybe not. But, I mean, you, uh, you know, now, nowadays we don't have the, the advantage of having a long apprentice system that's fed us a lot of information. You know, like I, and I think when that apprentice system died in the Industrial Revolution, that knowledge that resided in different guilds and different masters of different trades, it wasn't passed on. And it, there, was, there was a gap. You know, I mean, the reason I started doing this was because somebody told me once, you know, that's a lost art. Nobody does that anymore. Right. And I said, you know, why? You know, are we stupid? Well, you know, we still, we're still intelligent people. We just, no one has been thinking about it for a long time. And I think in the 70s, in the most recent sort of revival, you know, there was the, the hand tool crafts, you know, find woodworking magazine, the whole sort of back to the land and do things with your hand stuff came around. And so we're trying to reinvent the wheel in a lot of ways, in a lot of these trades, at least in this country. I think in Europe, there's more of an unbroken tradition. But in this country, we're, we're trying to refigure out these trades again. That's why this stuff is so expensive to do. Because you've got to search around for someone who can do it. Right. You know, it's not common. Right. Uh, this, is, this is why it's called a revolution. 
Industrial Revolution, as my high school history teacher used to say. So, quick example of what happens in wood to get at what some of these, this notion of loss we're talking about. Here's veneer cutting. Um, at the top is how Fife, well, that's what it is in, in the 18th century. Uh, two, two, two men cutting these thin slices of wood from a log, and you can see that what's gauging the straightness of the cut is just the cocked head of that figure on the right, right? Eyesight. Kind of amazing. And you actually read about um, cabinet makers going blind, and then it suddenly occurred to me that that's why. Uh, so then, then what happens, steam engine comes in, um, and woodworking isn't like um, weaving, where everything becomes automated, but there's certain processes, in, in particular how you move a tree or a log into pieces of stock gets totally changed by steam power. So this is a veneer saw circa 1840, right? So this is, this is probably humming in the background somewhere in New York City, not in Fife Shop necessarily, but he knows about it. And there's the, the big fan on the right, the fan belt, connecting to the ex external engine, driving the big saw, that wheel, and then you can see a, a board being peeled off. So the same thing's happening in both images, obviously much faster, presumably more accurate, presumably cheaper in the lower image. So um, in a way, if you're in this world, it's no wonder there's no argument for preservation of our cocked eyesight method. Um, but quickly, um, we, we talked a bit about did Fife embrace this or not, other makers of his time, that's um, Meeks on the bottom, this object peer table in the show, did um, Fife, I think we concluded maybe, maybe shied away from getting involved with some of the technological revolutions of his day. Well, I mean, I think that in the, in the lower image you see someone really figuring out that uh, scroll sawing was fun, you know? <laughs> uh, and then, and then realizing that, wow, and I've got all this veneer, too. <laughs> so let's see, what can I make? Um, so, I mean, so the, the, the technology definitely changed things. I mean, what, what used to be exotic and uh, unusual, you know, it's like when I was a little kid, color television, right, you know, uh, became boringly common. And so all of a sudden they're veneering everything with crotch mahogany veneer to the point where it's getting kind of cheesy, you know. Um, <laughs> to the point where actually later on, veneered stuff is considered inferior. So um, you see that you do see the industrial change driving it uh, between stuff that used to be exotic and expensive and, and pretty chic to have to something that's everywhere. And if it's everywhere, then who wants it anymore, right? You know, <laughs> right. If, you, if you want to be hip, you can't have what everyone has. And so you, then you want something different. But it, it, I don't know exactly what Spife reaction was to new technology, but, uh, you know, it, you can certainly see in, the, in his competition here, he, he certainly looks like he was taking advantage of it. Mm. So, back to the future, uh, for one, here's, here's one of your renderings, right? And I guess the question would be, like, what's the steam engine of our time as an early adapter, you might say? What, what is uh, the new technology that is going to revolutionize making um, for, for people working wood now? That's a, that's a gigantic question. Yeah, yeah. It's, I uh, gave you the easy ones first. Now I'm I ending think, with all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everything really. I mean, it's really hard to, to keep track of everything that's changing right now and how right. fast it's changing. Um, you know, I I've been visiting students in schools that are studying design, and they have access to so many things that I didn't have access to, and it makes me feel really old. But I, I just I just graduated, you know, ten years ago, nine years ago, and. Um, that was from undergrad, and then uh, they they have access to all these all these crazy machinery that normally would cost five hundred six hundred thousand dollars to own one of these things, but they have access to just you know use it willy nilly if if they want if they sign up on a sheet or something. Um, and now also there's I'm just going to go through some of the things that yeah. I think are changing because I can't. It's um, there's a the third ward. It's a it's a place in New York that uh, it's just a it's a it's in the I think it's in the third ward, but it's a it's a building that basically it's a hack shop who. They, they rent out tools like it's a gym membership. So you, know, so you might pay $40 a month, and you can go in there for X amount of hours per week or something to use their machinery. And it's brilliant. I mean, and it's a business model now that's spreading all over the country, and people are copying them. But so you can, you can have access to a laser cutter, a CNC cutter, uh, just a table saw, a band saw, a chop saw, regular wood shop tools, rapid prototypers, 3D printers. Um, all this stuff, and, um, and or and you can also rent a shop space in there as well if you want to, um, like a shop closet space. 
Um, and so now, these, now they're building, a, they're, they're expanding to Philadelphia. So they're doing well. In the recession, um, they're expanding to Philadelphia, which I think setting up a shop like that is not cheap. Um, Haystack School of Crafts up in Maine, Deer Isle, Maine. Uh, excellent school. They're working with MIT now with the Fab Lab. And so they're devoting an entire building up there just for CNC machinery and laser cutting. So they're really trying to combine craft. Because, you know, craft has gotten a, a, kind of a weird name over the past decade. And um, they're really trying to bring craft and MIT together, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's really, it's great to see. I think, I think what's really happening now is like, people are becoming very comfortable now with technology. And especially people that work with their hands, it takes, it takes them a little while to get comfortable with technology before they actually start working with, you know, the thing, and working with people that are experts in technology. And now I think it's a lot more, it's a lot much more accepted. Um, and it's something that I was really hoping for because when I was when I was learning how to use the computer and, and also learning how to use my hands in the wood shop or in the metal shop, um, you know, you actually get shunned by the craft world if you were using the computer. That's the way I felt like ten years ago. Um, you know, I, I like taking my own photographs. I like uh, doing my own website. All these things, and it's uh, to me it was just a way of saving money. But it was, but in the end, it also influenced my work really heavily. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I think today's steam engine is basically uh, the computer processor. I think is really what it comes down to. But uh, but I think the the important thing is to always find an equilibrium or a balance between that processor, the, the hand, and the machine. And you know, if you can find a, a balance with those three things, um, I think you get some really interesting work. If you have too much dependency on on technology, for instance, then you're going to see a lot of the same work pop out over and over again. That was well said, uh, point for the future, and I think we'll, we'll end there to give you all time to go back uh, through the show. So thank you all for coming.